go live. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. So I've got some guests over this weekend. And usually this, this uh, green screen setup here that's not very green is usually just made for one person. But now that we have two people on camera, mm -hmm. uh, you get to see the, the lovely backdrop. Ooh. And so hopefully it doesn't cover up too, too much of the screen. Um, you kind of missed a little bit of a, a crisis with the um, broadcast software because this is a new laptop. And it just occurred to me that this is the first time that I've used this laptop. Um, and I was literally installing stuff earlier this morning. And when I first fired up the stream, for the people that out there that actually know anything about streaming, uh, there's something called dropped frames. And I was dropping 30 frames per second. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know what, that's, that's, that's not good. <laughs> that's, that's usually a sign that something's gone terribly wrong. And luckily, I was able to like just fiddle around a little bit. And currently, we have zero dropped frames rather than what would be 1,200 by now. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. So for those of you who don't know, this is Stephanie, Hi. Queen of Reef on Instagram. And she, YouTube. And YouTube. And are you on Facebook? Yeah. I'm on Facebook, too. I post on Facebook. Yeah. There Queen of Reef everywhere. So. Yeah. She's she's here for the clout. I'm here for the clout. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Come on. He was yeah. having a live stream. I wasn't going to join on. It's actually yeah. fun. So she's uh, she's here with her boyfriend, David. And David will probably come and hang out with us a little bit later. He used to work at Top Shelf Aquatics, and he is now an engineer. Mm -hmm. So he has left the aquatics industry, much to the chagrin of many, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> so yeah, he's 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 off camera, just just hanging out. But anyway, guys. Um, so the countdown timer has started, and we'll get going with the um, with the coral shortly. Uh, we can see chats looking pretty good. I'm assuming that you guys can actually hear what I'm saying. Because we usually spend like the first 10 minutes or so. Wouldn't that be awkward if this yeah, entire time? This entire time. But it's, it's <laughs> happened before where like, you know, we're doing like a sound check basically. And it's like, oh, good. Uh, the thing just wasn't working. Or I had the microphone set up wrong and it's like doing an echo. Mm -hmm. like Stuff like that. Yeah. That's not great. No. So we have some comments. We have some comments. And as an engineer too into aquatics. There you go. There you go. Brandy missing out on a fun weekend. Audio's good. See, that, that's that, that's the beauty of it. You just have to ask, and people are going to be like, they'll, they'll chime in. Yeah. And this isn't like a gaming stream where people will just lie about the audio. Yeah. They'll, they'll be like, yeah, can you guys hear me? Nope, nope, sounds dead. Oh. Screen's dead. <laughs> I didn't even know that happened. Oh, all the that time. That would stress me out. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So if you guys need to, for us to turn up the volume or anything, just let me know. But chances are, it's it looks, as far as like the meters go and everything, it looks fine. Uh, real quick, I want to take the time. There, OK, there's two mice and two keyboards. So I have to, have to grab the right one. Uh, I'll say my quick thank yous to the Patreon and YouTube member crowd. So real quick, uh, thank you to Elaine Martinassi, Aline Barley, that's a new person. Alan Jackson, Ann Lewis, Brandy Camp, Chuck Admire, Greg, Greg Zimmerman, Harkins Aquatics, Jordan Marty, Keith Singer, Kyle Jamison, Lisa Whitmarsh Laddie, that's a new name, uh, Lisa Clow, Lackery Fine Art, Lynn Holt, Puddle Aquatics. By the way, I don't know if you know, have you ever met Lisa? She's in, she's in Dallas. I don't think I ever. Oh, no, 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 no. I, yeah, uh, she, she goes to Aquashellas also. I think I might have, yeah. So she's the one who kind of like it got me going better on Patreon. Mm -hmm. She makes like eight grand a month on Patreon. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. So anyway, Lynn Holt, Puddle Aquatics, Ryan Baker, Scott Williams, Skylar Korn, Sue Hemmons, Thomas Tarrant, and Tim Garner. Thank you guys so much. And on the YouTube side, we've got Carlos Fernandez, Chris Jordan, Steven13, Mike Downey, Keith Holland, Terry Kuhn, Herb777, Justin Harden, and Ohio Adventures. And also thank you to our corporate sponsor, Polyp Lab, who I nearly killed when he came and visited. 
I told these guys that story, but uh, for those for the folks in chat that have not heard the story, you know, he uh, came over from Montreal. Phil from Polyp Lab came over to record a podcast, and I took him to my favorite restaurant in town. And it turns out that he had an allergy to something seafoody. He it's like unclear what it was, but he had something uh, something going on. And we had to spend a good portion of that morning um, in the parking lot of the uh, the emergency room, uh, popping Benadryl until his throat opened up. Yeah, and then we shot a podcast. So he was a, he was a trooper. Shout oh out to gosh. Phil. Okay. 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 Uh, B says there might be some fuzz, but it might be my computer. It could be your computer because I know about her computer. It barely works. <laughs> uh, let's see. Goodyear Reefer, shout out from Uniontown. What's up? Thank you for joining. Red Eye Reefer, good afternoon. Great. I All am right. having a total blast, by the way. I love coming and visiting here. There's just so much to see. We went to Eye Catching Corals, too, mm -hmm. yesterday. That's a wholesaler that's near here. They've got a really cool facility. Very not open to the public. Yeah, it was just unbelievable, the scale of it. And I really enjoyed it. That was awesome. Yeah. So the idea about this weekend, though, was we were going to take it as chill as possible. And already we've been busy. Obviously visiting a wholesaler, doing this live stream. Mm -hmm. We're probably going to be shooting some stuff later. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so... But it's been fun. It's we try to we try to keep it as chill as possible, especially for these guys. Because like Stephanie, you can tell them like, um, like you were in law school for the long, longest time, and you, and you got your first law job. I did in criminal defense, and and supposedly from the other coworkers there that have like had other jobs at other places, this place is particularly meat grindery. Yeah, yeah, like it's a lot of work. I lo work very long hours, um, but I love it. I absolutely adore criminal defense. I think I was, I don't know, for the longest time I was doubting whether I was going you know, to be a, if, if it was a good, if it was a good decision to go to law school and do the whole lawyer thing. But, um, this has totally reaffirmed me that this is. That's great. Cause be. it was, it's, that's never a clear thing. Like, right. I, I pretty much knew that it was not going to be for me. And so I just started to yeah. grow coral instead. Yeah. But yes, but it, yeah. Cause like you were kind of like doubting it for a little bit. Then you jumped into it and loved it. Oh, no, I'm sickly obsessed. I don't think I work, like, a day of my life. Like, sure, I work 10-hour days, but I don't feel it at all. Yeah, that's it's so It's, like, strange. so fun to me. It's so I don't strange. know. I know, it is kind of strange. David makes fun of me all the time because he's like, what kind of sick person enjoys work this much? <laughs> Coming from him, that is extremely <laughs> whack. Uh... Extremely. Okay, the picture in picture video for me is fuzzy on my TV and computer. Interesting. I wonder why that is. I wonder why that would be. I don't know. That okay, is. So the countdown is coming in clear. Pull up your stream to check. Can someone off screen pull up your screen to check? David? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it fuzzy? Yes. It's fuzzy. The, uh, like the, the face camera is? Interesting. I wonder why that is. Huh. That's really interesting. It's, it is like tack sharp on my screen. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll fiddle with it for just a little bit. But we're, we're just about ready to start the coral thing. So I need to do this little transition. Somebody said no fuzzy here. So no fuzzy. looks good on my phone. It's so weird because it's like, yeah, because it, lo it looks weird on David's phone. It's clear on my TV. Face camera's fuzzy. I'll, I'll, I'll fiddle just a wee tad, but um, looks fine here. <laughs> yeah, weird. Hmm. I wonder if, uh, yeah, because it looks fuzzy on there too. On the preview screen but not on my broadcast effort so anyway let me uh, do this little transition real quick um 
you know, let me toy with that. Seems to be focusing a little, but then going fuzzy again. OK, that just might be autofocus. No, but I, I mean, uh, it, that looks fine. That looks fine. That looks fine. Oops. Clear as a bell. Clear as a bell. They said it's not, uh, she said it's not bad, though. It just isn't the same resolution as the countdown screen. That's so weird. It should be crazy tack sharp. Yeah. Google, I blame you. This is YouTube's fault. This is not me. <laughs> this is not me. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been doing this for like 10 years, or every right. month for 10 years. Nah, Google. You're messing up my life. <laughs> Anyway, you get the idea, even if we're blurry. Hopefully, you know, as long as the corals aren't blurry. You know, right. Screw my face. You guys, you guys don't yeah. need to see my face. <laughs> don't need to see mine either, so. KB Reef. Dave is a wealth of reef knowledge. I hope he joins soon. Already. Already. Already, David. Already, David. No, he really is, I think, one of the most knowledgeable people in this hobby. He's, Period. He's very obsessed. He's sickly it. obsessed. It's a lot. Like, th th he breathes corals and reef, all reef stuff. Yeah, like, uh, he was telling me that he, um, when, uh, he should probably be one telling these stories, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> but he was saying that, like, he, you know, even when he started working as an engineer, he wanted to, like, basically volunteer at another shop just to get his hands wet. Mm -hmm. And he has a home aquarium. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't have to go out and, like, do more yeah. on top of that. But, yeah, he's very much into it. Extremely so. so. And he's been in the hobby since 95, so he's seen it all, too, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> it's like, I don't even know when I started this hobby. Um I think I started when I was like eight years old. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. So that's like what, 29 years? Wow. I've been in the hobby for maybe nine years or eight years, which I think is a long time. It's a super long time. So for the folks out there that don't know, the average length that somebody stays in this hobby is about 24 months. Wow. 18 to 24 months. Yeah. So it's, it's like that statistic of like small businesses. It's like, a huge yeah. number of small businesses go out of business in that first year. Same sort of thing is true for the reef aquarium hobby. And it doesn't feel like it because I think that the people that are more into the hobby tend to gravitate towards, like, resources and communities that are very, like, for the, for the most part, like, high level. So, like, they're on reef to reef, like, chatting with people there i mean not, not that i love everything that i read on reef to reef not, not that i love everything that i read on facebook but they're actively talking about stuff yeah right? and interacting with others in the community i, I think that's yeah but most people don't most people just in silence have aquariums right. and kill stuff and quit <laughs> that's just like super par for the course oh yeah and they have they just have no idea why stuff is going poorly right and they do i mean i i remember like people just like the like the type of horror stories that i would hear uh are just like my brain just simply did not go to that level mm -hmm. like they were trying to save money by just using morton salt <laughs> Sorry. Like, I shouldn't laugh. Yeah, it's like we, we don't. We, I don't have to buy this expensive, expensive instant ocean. I can just get Morton's. Yeah. It's like not the same thing. No. <laughs> at all. It didn't work out. Oh, but gosh. that's not the. I mean, like I'm not even talking about like a single individual that did that. Like a lot of people I've heard did that. Yeah. And I'm just trying to like extrapolate like how many more like ridiculous stories are out there like that. I'm sure. You know. I mean, I've, I've heard of stories where people just buy, uh, like, saltwater stuff for their freshwater tank. and just, <laughs> They just had no idea that, that clownfish were saltwater. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah, so that the idea that, oh, people exit this hobby between 18 to 24 months, it's like, it sounds crazy. It does. Like yeah, I mean, it sounds about right, It's a lot of people out there too. bad at it. 
And especially, like, when you encounter problems, I mean, are you going to give up or are you just going to keep going? Because when I first started, I think I got bryopsis, but Mm -hmm. I got the wrong advice. Everybody thought it was green hair algae. So nothing that people were recommending for me to remove it was working. And I just remember battling with it, suffocating all my corals for, like, well over a year. And Mm -hmm. I got rid of bryopsis with water changes alone. Really? Yeah. Which, okay. which it was hard. hard. To do. Yeah. Right. I mean, but like, I don't know what on earth possessed me to do so. A lot of people probably wouldn't. They'd give up, you know. So I can see that definitely. Because especially in the beginning, you face all sorts of hurdles. Aptasia seems like the worst possible thing to get rid of. I mean, you just don't have experience dealing with all these pests that pop up. and Yeah. So I guess like a couple of, of things happen there with pests and with like algae and things like that is I think that it, maybe this is where um, the community doesn't do a great job. Because uh, if, you, if you hear from somebody that they've had like aptasia or hair algae or bryopsis, like it sounds like the worst thing ever, mm-hmm. right? Most of these things have ways to treat them, right? right? right. But so it sounds like a, big, a like a huge crisis. But then on top of that, you get the, well, I don't ever want to have that Like as a beginner. Right. I don't ever want that in my tank. So I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that ever from mm-hmm. happening. And then going to the extremes. So the chances of you stopping bryopsis from ever getting into your tank is like basically zero. Like the, the, these pests or pests, not even everything that's, that's considered a pest these days really is one. But things like, like hair algae. If, if somebody out there says, I can keep hair algae out of my tank, period, end of story, it's like maybe if you're t- keeping a tank of bleach, like there's <laughs> right. no freaking way that you're going to do any kind of methodology that's going to keep hair algae out. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and you don't have to because hair algae is one of those things that just doesn't really do that well in a fully functioning, healthy aquarium. Right. But, yeah, I think that sometimes, like, yeah, people g- get uh, a lot of these – very normal, treatable things, you know, in, in like a tizzy about. Right. So. And then it becomes overwhelming. I mean, you know. Yeah, and certainly nothing to quit the hobby over. Like you're gonna right. quit your, you're gonna quit the hobby over hair algae, really? Yeah. I mean, you know, especially when but you're it, first picking up something and you don't really develop the passion yet. But yeah. that's why when you've been over that two year hump, I feel like you're in it for life. Like at that point. You'll never, even if you take a break from the hobby for a few years, you'll always have a reef tank again. I mean, I just feel like once you're hooked, you're really hooked. Let me tell uh, like a newbie story now that I just went on this tirade about like <laughs> about pests and algae. Let's hear it. So I started my first freshwater tank in 20 years, just recently. And it was because I had some mangroves next door in the greenhouse. My greenhouse really isn't much of a greenhouse anymore. So it wasn't, they weren't getting enough light. The extent that they weren't getting enough light was that I've got security cameras, and even during the middle of the day in a greenhouse with tank lights on, the uh, the security cameras, their night vision was on. Oh. That, that's how dark it was in there. So my poor mangroves, they weren't doing well. Oh. So I set up a little nano tank here, put a plant light over it, put the, put the mangroves in there, and... It's a freshwater tank because I heard that like mangroves actually do better in freshwater Mm -hmm. and it's a freshwater substrate and these mangroves look super upset, (laughs) look super upset. And then I have basically freshwater hair algae in there and it looks gross and snotty. And I'm just sitting back thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. Do you, are you going to give it up? No. Uh, well, no, but uh, the mangroves might give it up for me right. when they die. Yeah. But, like, who, who kills mangroves? Like, in just put – what out? They're, they're, not, they're not doing well. Not, not doing well at all. But, yeah, so that's, that's, that's my noob Recent s- noob. story. I can't do fresh water, apparently. Okay, catching up on chat just a little bit. Let's see if, you, if they have any questions for you. Mm-hmm. Probably not. <laughs> um, let's see. Brandon picked up some Blue Raven Blaster Merletti. Already seeing some crazy growth. Triple oh. heads. That's nice. I'll be back in a second. Super nice. 
up fam quit the hobby salt here is now ninety dollars for a box of instant ocean that was a recent development relatively recent i mean i heard like rumblings that salt prices were gonna go crazy but uh it was kind of one of those things that i had heard it was gonna happen and then it kind of didn't happen and then slowly brands started to like bump up the prices bump up the prices bump up the prices and then we had a stretch of like a couple of years where there was like this huge increase in prices so yes salt for me went from one of those things that was like such an easy to justify uh, maintenance task because salt at the time was so inexpensive and the benefits were so pronounced that it's like yeah just keep doing big water changes because this is like literally the best thing you could do for the money now i mean it's a lot of money for for salt and you know you're talking to a guy that you know has to buy it two three pallets at a time that's not a fun bill so we have we still do quite a bit of water changes but we have to be a little bit more thoughtful and diligent and strategic about how we're using water changes like the the days of us just you know trying to do like a one big 20 percent water change and big it's big because like our our, our systems are between a thousand to 2500 gallons right uh, that stuff kind of like went to the wayside. So a lot of the water that's leaving our facility now is just from packing corals for orders. Like a lot of water leaves that way. But when we're actually doing maintenance and water changes, I like to use like the water as like a vehicle to remove detritus and stuff like that and like to do in detailing the tank. And so it's just like, a, like an export mechanism that way. So uh, we don't just want to just pump out a bunch of what looks like water that's perfectly fine. It's like I want to actively remove detritus out, stuff like that. So, yeah, we, we had to change that up. And the other thing that really has helped us very recently is that we paid a lot closer attention to trace elements. Um, we're not at the stage where we're trying to, like, tweak trace elements to any particular level. But, you know, we're sending out regular ICPs, which is, which is kind of an endeavor because we have like eight super big systems. And that's eight ICPs every month, basically. And the only thing that we're looking to accomplish with trace element additives is we just wanted to get it off of zero. Let's say, uh, I don't know, nickel or molybdenum is low, just some random trace element. It's not important to me that... Um, we hit the correct amount. We don't want to go overboard on anything. Obviously, we don't do, don't want to overdose on like a heavy metal. But um, as long as it's off of zero and bioavailable, which is another question altogether, but as long as it shows up on a test, we're pretty happy. And I think that like by by doing fewer water changes or fewer vol, you know percent volume. Uh, it's more important to pay attention to to stuff that bottoms out like that. So anyway, yeah, we'll figure your freshwater issues. We just need to talk to Julian. And also, uh, I make it sound like we've put a lot of effort into this. We haven't. We literally just put the put the the plants in there, and we just sat back and looked at it. <laughs> we just did our first water change on that tank with fresh water. Not a whole lot of of work getting done. Courtney Jameson, in Arizona, the reef crystals are $90 for a five-gallon bucket when not on sale. And, guys, reef crystals and instant ocean, that's the cheap stuff, right? It's not like, what's the most expensive salt brand out there right now? Is it Tropic Marine? Is, it, is that one still, like, a, a big-ticket item? I've never used it before, but I stick with, like, the super basic... Uh, old navy of salts <laughs> just keep it real simple and low drama um let's see you, you might need to do a, a brackish fiddler crabitat for the mangroves see that that to me is a little bit too much effort because uh we have this tank upstairs and upstairs means less access to salt water 
like all of our saltwater infrastructure is downstairs, so I just kind of wanted to make it like a, a freshwater thing. So I was thinking maybe we'll just put like one betta in there, or just like a couple of little amano shrimps or something. Arkansas Petco price for a bucket of reef crystals is a dollar a dollar twenty five. A hundred and twenty-five dollars before taxes. Yikes. Dan Lehrman. So what's the market's justification for such price increases? Um, so the word on the street there is input cost on salt and transport. Um, I can't speak on any of the input cost stuff possible. Don't know. But I can for sure say that uh, to ship anything anywhere costs a mint to do here. It's insane. Okay. <laughs> Dangles, great prices on flights to Roatan for what we would do for when we do the TG dive trip. Hopefully I can still dive at that time. It's like I haven't dove in so long. So out of practice. Yeah, I normally buy 200 gallon boxes of instant ocean, ran out of salt and went to purchase one. Found the cheapest IO was $90 a box or more. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pricey stuff. And again, this is the cheap stuff. I remember not that long ago, uh, there was a local company and I was, I was wholesaling, uh, buying, you know, like pallets of the stuff wholesale. And I remember like the, the, the first number was like a three. It was like 30 something dollars. Not, you know, I, I mean, wholesale prices now, you're lucky to see a five at the start of those things. <laughs> Fives. Hell, used to get Fritz salt for $40 a box from a local club. Even now that stuff is like 80 to $90. I did not know that. Um, We've got a pretty good relationship with uh, with Sean Hale at Fritz, but um, we don't use a ton of Fritz product. I think that we use some of like their Turbo Start, and then he gifted me some some boxes of salt to try out. And so we're doing that in like some of our smaller aquariums, like our quarantine and stuff. But um, yeah, we still primarily use uh, reef crystals. Kai says, in Germany, Tropic Marine and Fauna Marine are the most expensive salts. Not surprising. Not too surprising at all. So I'm wondering, okay, so for the folks that were seeing a blurry um, up-close video, um, what, has anything changed there? Because I'm still looking here, and I look clear, and I'm wondering if, like, if my eyes are playing tricks on me or if it's actually getting clearer so you have to help me out on that oh by the way david is probably going to join me later but i think that he wanted to go downstairs and look at coral i don't blame him <laughs> yeah oh and he, I've, um, stephanie just said you just went to go get coffee which is also a good idea i can't i can't knock on that either i should go get a coffee do you want to take over the stream, yeah. and I'll get I'll get a coffee. Leave. Everybody leave. Yeah, no, that's I'm not gonna happen. Coffee. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna get coffee service. Mm -hmm. Oh man, Matt Smoyer, hello, welcome to the stream, Matt. Uh, okay, so Jamie Garcia is asking, what camera and lenses do you use for the live close-up shots? It's beautiful. We go a little hard here when it comes to camera stuff. Um, the two cameras that we use the most are Canon cinema cameras. One is a Canon C200, and there's a newer, smaller model called a Canon C70. Don't look up the prices. They're, it's like sticker shock worthy. They're very expensive cameras. Um, luckily, unless you're doing crazy stuff, a lot of their normal consumer line will more than do the trick for you. Like you'd have to look for 
you'd have to be looking for very specific features to be buying the cameras that we're buying. So right now, the thing that's pointed at my face is a Canon C70. But the lenses are probably the more important thing to, to pay attention to. Um, so the lenses that we're using to get like all of our coral shots are 100 millimeter Canon macro lenses. And those are outstanding. Lucky thing about macro lenses is this is just like a, a lens geeky thing. But the way that macro lenses are designed, they are naturally crazy sharp. So even if you're able to find a relatively inexpensive macro lens, it's going to be one of the highest performing lenses you can get your hands on. The ones we use are expensive though. They're about 800 to to thousand dollars. But I think that you can find used very similar, like practically optically no different in performance. Uh, you could probably find something similar used for like under $300. But again, we're looking for super specific things that we're willing to pay that premium for. Dent Guy 42. Wish I was still in Ohio to come see your corals in person. I gotta say, um, lately we've had a lot of visitors here from out of town. So uh, Be the Fountain, she came over like a couple weeks ago. Last week? It's been so long, I forget. I think it was like, it was a, Brandy, help me out. Was it last week? Were you here last week? Here, I'm gonna have to check the calendar real fast. I'm blanking. Uh, it was two weeks ago. All right, cool. Um, so I had had Brandy over. Obviously, David and Stephanie are over this weekend. Next weekend, Ryan from the Bulk Reef Supply will be over. So there's been kind of like a little bit of extra motivation to clean up our tanks. So right now, if anybody is like wanting to make an appointment and see the tanks, the tanks are kind of looking unsustainably clean. So it's a good time to take a look at stuff. Things are looking very, very nice. Uh, Clay is asking, any advice on attaching Zoas to rock? Snip the peg and attach the disc? You could. Honestly, what we tend to do is we just shove that little, um, that little stem into the rock and let the zoanthids just cover everything. Like, I almost think that the stem helps in that regard to kind of like anchor it. Um, people can go one step extra and like put some, some, I was about to say silly putty, but you know, like the, the whatever putty. And that tends to help. I typically don't though. I just like stick it on there and just let it grow. We, to, I'll, I'll give you an idea of like how well that stuff works, just setting it there. Because in our SPS show tank, originally, excuse me, we were, um, we were sticking corals down with the whole putty thing. They would encrust. And um, so if we ever had a problem, like, you know what, that colony there looks suspicious. We wouldn't be able to, like, remove it very easily. It's already grown onto the rocks. So if we were really suspicious, we would have to, like, break that off, send it over to, like, quarantine or dipping or whatever we wanted to do. And whatever is, like, encrusting there, we had to kill it with calcwasser to make sure that whatever it is, it's dead. So if it had a problem, it's, it's going to be killed by calc. So what we did in the future was, okay, we're going to put it on, on like three to four inch tiles. And they don't look that great, but we're going to grow the coral on there, three to four inch tile, and set that on the rock. So if, there, if there's anything that's looking suspicious, again, we would grab the entire thing and then treat it. The corals are growing over that entire three to four inch tile and then onto the rocks. So now it's just like, you know, we just have to to deal with it in tank because having stuff be very easily removable isn't really a thing. So don't underestimate how quickly your corals will do that. It will, they will, if things are going well, they will do it so well that you can't stop them from growing onto the rock like that.
Melissa from CJ and I were there last week. She suggested that we just move in with Dan. He quickly rejected that idea. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. I need my alone time. Greetings. So pineapple under the sea. Greetings from Malaysia. It's 3.30 a.m. midnight. Uh, never miss the Title Gardens live show. Oh, thanks so much. I'm not sure how you it. I, black is fine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Gonna come back on camera? Yeah. Okay, I'll scoot over. Hi Stephanie's guys, back. what did I miss? Oh, we were complaining about salt prices mainly. Mm, yeah. What salt do you use? Red Sea Blue Bucket. Red Sea Blue Bucket, okay. Yes. How much is Red Sea Blue Bucket? It's kind of expensive. But <laughs> we buy like... the, um, the one of the stores. David usually gets picks up the salt for us, but um, he gets the big sacks. Okay. I'm not sure how much the big sacks cost. Wait, what do you mean? Like, what, the what's a big sack? Like, like, not the bucket, like a sack. And it's usually not sold. It's, to so like, it's like a know. public aquarium bag. Yeah, like one of those. One of our local reef stores. It? How does he move it? Like... He just puts the sack over his shoulder. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean. Okay, so the, so usually when I think of like a, a sack of salt. Yes. It usually has to be like forklifted. Okay, maybe it's not that big of a sack. <laughs> maybe I'm <laughs> wait, but, not describing this correctly. But wait, it's like... about, it's like a sandbag. Okay. Like similar to a sandbag. I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to ask you. You're gonna it's like, have to ask. Wait a minute. It's like you... I, I can't carry two boxes. It's just a little more than than the bucket. I mean, it's not oh, much okay. Okay. bigger than the bucket. I it gotcha. just comes in sack form. And... Oh, okay. Yeah, chat's probably like you, dumb dumb. Don't you know anything about Red Sea products? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about Red Sea. Oh. Okay. Oh, K Nels, how's Factor going? I just started. Okay. Let me give my, okay, not sponsored by Factor. I'm the only guy on YouTube not sponsored by Factor. They sponsored everybody else but me. Uh, so, fact, did you, get, did you get contact by Factor? I wouldn't, no, I haven't. Oh. I, I've, I've just written off. Busy? Yeah. <laughs> Any kind of sponsorships. Busy being a lawyer. Yeah. But, okay, so Factor meals are like a microwave meal service. They deliver to your place for the whole week. They're fresh meals, and they're crazy healthy. So I went to the doctor. I need something like that. Honestly, uh, I don't have time to cook. I needed it. To, so I went to the doctor. Doctor said, uh, yeah, whatever it is you're doing right now, you need to stop all that. Uh, stop that. Yeah, and you need, you need to, like, decide for yourself if you really want to live. Oh I'm like, God. wow, that's not great. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. But he had, like, a, a resident also training. Uh -huh. And she's, like, a younger woman. And she's like, what do you eat? And I'm like, well, I, you know what? COVID messed me up because uh, it got me into the habit of just ordering food. Mm -hmm. And so I'm door dashing everything Every for so three bad. years. Yeah. It, yeah. It'll do it and, real and quick. And uh, I live in, like, Podunk, Ohio. So there's no healthy choices. Yeah. Like, the healthy section is, like, pizza, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm screwed. Um, so, but she said, no, try factor. It's going to work. I'm like, really? She's like, yes. My, my, my classmates in, in medical school and I, we do it. We see the results. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. Sure enough. First time I ever tried factor meals. It was like, I had double the energy. Oh, really? Like, instantly double the energy. I'm like, oh, because this stuff is just nutritious. Right. And doesn't have hardly any carbs or anything like right. that. Doesn't and make you feel sluggish or. I know, lost gross. at least ten pounds. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Wow. And I feel like so much so better. So much better. Yeah. Having said that, I'm taking a break from Factor for two weeks because guests are coming over and we're just going out to eat. So it's like I'm not going to be serving Oops. them microwave meals. <laughs> so we had waffles this morning. Oh yeah, so yummy. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm like I'm carb loading, guys. I'm carb loading. <laughs> You're bulking. Okay. Reef Exotico by Luis. Going to make it to restock, Dan. I'll make an old-fashioned tasting menu. A little birdie gave me the key. <laughs> so, okay. Yes, I will be going. And yes, Luis, it is, um, 
it is absolutely part of the plan to come see you at your restaurant. Um, when I visited Denver to go visit uh, Jake, this was uh, like a couple years ago at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I visited Jake Adams at and, and did the whole thing with Reef Builders at his studio and stuff. And mm-hmm. he took me out to this restaurant that, that that's Luis's place. Oh. And I didn't hear this until later, okay? But Jake told Luis, like, Fan really loves mole, mole sauce. And and Luis is like, that's not on the menu. We don't we don't serve mole at the restaurant. Yeah. So he went out and got the ingredients to make mole just because he heard that we were going to be there oh and that gosh. I liked mole. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. But what really stole the show is that he has like this bean dish. Mm-hmm. And those beans are nuts. Like they're just insanely tasty. It's like the best beans I've ever had. And I'm like, it's still to this day, I'm like, how were they that good? Yeah. Because like Windsor, uh, like Jake's wife, and I were, we were both like these beans. What the hell. Man? <laughs> these beans are everywhere. What the hell. <laughs> <laughs> so we absolutely are planning to come in and, and see you again, Luis. And and you know what? The the the, the bourbon tasting is also fine. I'll, I'll make it work. Mm. The old fashions. Mm. <laughs> Dan <laughs> Dan Lerman is like. An old-fashioned tasting menu. I'm in. <laughs> it's like what's this? What's this event called? Reef stock. Oh my gosh! <sighs> you dead? <laughs> I don't that even... scared me. Oh, the seat felt like went back. <laughs> it scared me. I thought it was gonna fall over. It's a regular chair, you guys. It's, it's on camera. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Everybody saw that. I'm gonna. Walk and shake. <laughs> it's a regular chair. <laughs> you get under. Come on. Oh man. I'm thinking, what a dumb fan. It's like the size of a small, medium bag of dirt. Great. I was talking about the salt. Mm-hmm. It's a sack. Oh man. You go in there and explain it as a sack. Irene Clapper, carnivores live better. Um, if that's in in relation to like my diet, I'm definitely eating a very carnivore diet. I think the problem was like the processed carbs, though, like the breads and stuff. I think that was like the end of me. You want to, want to sit down? Yeah. Sure. No, are you sure you might not follow? <laughs> I'll ha- I'll try to handle the seat the best I can. So this is David. Uh, that's a Stephanie's bow. Uh, uh, I am the boat. <laughs> hey guys. I was, I was about to make a very, very, very off color joke based on breakfast this morning. I ain't going to do that though. Uh, so, David used to work at, uh, at Top Shelf Aquatics, direct competitor of Tidal Gardens. <laughs> oh, God. I'm sitting with the competition. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so now uh, he, does, uh, he does work in engineering. And now we get to talk about robots and robot warehouses. Yes. If we're trying to get uh, the automation world into uh, Tidal Gardens world. Yeah. Having robots control and run the entire facility on hand, delivering yeah. goods and everything. That'd be nice. <laughs> That's his dream. Because because like, the, the number one thing I'm looking to do is to not walk through a warehouse. Like, you have to fall I over too. You. I'm fine. I'm fine. I told you. What is up with you people from Texas? Do you guys not sit in chairs? <laughs> <laughs> the seat is on roller skates. No, it's like <laughs> it's, it goes all the way back. It's I like mean, roller please. blade wheels. Oh my gosh! I'm gonna. I, 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 what time point are we at? Okay, I'm gonna have to show this to Becca. Be like, okay. These guys, these both of them nearly like <laughs> took a spill on your chair. There's a little bit of a tilt to it. <laughs> See, I'm not crazy. Uh, okay. And the sack you were talking about is the Red Sea. They're 55 pounds. Red Sea blue bucket salt. So instead of buying the actual it's bucket It's 55 itself, pounds? 55 pounds. It goes up for like 200 gallons. For, okay, so it's like a box the, of salt. Yeah. Okay. So it's right. not that bad. Gotcha. Gotcha. I was like, a, a sack? Like, when I think of, like, a sack of instant ocean, it comes on a crane. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the way I heard about it, it's, 
how does he carry it in the house? And she goes, oh, he just throws it over his shoulder. I'm like, I'm like it's not that kind of sack. It's, it's like, like not, not, not him. <laughs> <laughs> there's some there's some people that think maybe they could throw it over their shoulder. <laughs> he ain't throwing it over his shoulder. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm past those days. Uh, so, Stephanie, are you going to reef stock? Um, are you going to reef stock? I'm definitely going to reef stock. Okay, then I'll go too. Yes, Stephanie will be at reef stock. I have been to reef stock. It is a lot of fun. Man, okay, so so Brandy just said, oh, my God, I fall out of that chair all the time, too, Stephanie. Dan is like, <laughs> Dan is like be still. <laughs> you just lean slightly back, and it has this little tipping point where it just kind of jerks Takes you backwards. all the way back. <laughs> you're not going to fall. You're just pushing too far. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> oh, man. That's, that's, Be- that's Becca's normal chair. Oh, so, God. Yep, that, that's, that's to her settings. Uh, let's see. I have an Oaxacan old fashioned that is so good if you're into mezcal. You know, mm. okay. I haven't had good mezcal before. That's I think that's my problem. Do you like do you, do? I don't do think the, I can't. The last time I tried mezcal. Mm. Let me tell you my mezcal no. story. So one day, uh, my friends uh, from college were having like a birthday party for one of us. And they wanted to do a tequila tasting. Okay, sounds sounds good so far, but it was all celebrity tequilas. Oh. So we tried the P Diddy no. one. We tried the Rock one. Oh, no. We tried the George Clooney one. We the did the Kendall ones from one. the the two guys from Breaking Bad. Oh god, <laughs> that's Every gonna be. Have- we did Justin Timberlake's. It was like. Awful. <laughs> like, straight all, awful. Because they're all professional, you know, little liquor makers there. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The finest <laughs> of the fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, I'm sure that, that That's P. Really Diddy. That's a party idea, though. It's actually kind of funny. It's, it, it's funny. It's for the memes. And we, we sat there with actually scorecards and rated these things. And those mezcals that. were disgusting. Really? Like, absolutely <laughs> awful. So I'm sure I did not have a great, uh, a great first experience by design. Yeah. Like, it was always doomed for failure. <laughs> <laughs> I am sure after X amount of ours having enough of them, you can ha- eventually make it a good time. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and, and somebody in chat is probably like, but I like the rock tequila. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the finest tequila you could find. <sighs> I feel so good. <laughs> <The chair. laughs> I missed it. Which, 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 which what, what comment? Oh, I feel so. She says, "I feel so vindicated right now. I hate that chair." <laughs> if it was in all capital letters, <laughs> she's had thoughts and feelings about this chair for some time now. Apparently, <laughs> that's a great chair. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's like a Herman Miller Aluminum Group chair. It's like a real one. It's not a knockoff. As, as long as I sit straight, it's perfect. <laughs> but if I try to relax just ever so slightly, that's how everybody keeps working. If they try to relax at any point, it gives them a little tip towards backwards. Okay, so Jason Whitley is asking, what's the best spot feed for Duncan Coral? Best spot feed? Some of the feeds I like to... I use a lot of the powder feeds at first. I use a lot of the Fauna Marin feeds. Okay. Uh, for those ones are, of course, Coral Dust and such, uh, Sprint. Those are my two favorite ones. But for LPS, LPS pellets from them, I've been using those for years. The Fauna? Yeah, the Fauna Marin. I think that's... Okay, so hot take... That's the best product they've ever made. Mm-hmm. Like, just like the, those LPS pellets. Like, and really good. Those LPS pellets, those were, uh, for a longer time, those were the only feed, coral feed we had in the entire store for any LPS for years and mm-hmm. years. And it takes, like, one pellet. Oh, yeah. That, that's all you needed, like, for an entire pellet. One pellet. Oh, yeah. And for some of the LP trachies, of course, I put a sprinkle, a couple extra, maybe six or so, and all of a sudden, the tentacles would just immediately emerge grab the pellets, and I would just feed them ever so often, and everything ate it. Mm-hmm. From frimophilia, euphilia, trachies, scolemia, it, it, I mean, everyone, as far as it took them in. We're feeding a lot of, uh, so, so first of all, Dunkins will pretty much eat anything. Oh, yeah. Like, they are one of the, that, that's kind of like the, the nice thing about Dunkins, is that they are so aggressive about eating. Yeah. They'll just eat anything. Uh, oh, yeah. So we do a lot of, like, frozen mysis, frozen krill, that type of stuff. Um, but, like, the, as far as powdered foods, you know, we've always had, like, really good success with um, with 
Title Gardens corporate sponsor, <laughs> Polyp Lab Refroids. But uh, any of those things are like very, you know, like nutritious. And it's more about, to me, about um, finding the, the amount that you can feed without bombing out your system. Because a lot of that stuff is super rich and super nutrient yes. dense. Uh, so this is my um, not uh, reef tank dad of the year story. <laughs> but so I have a, a, a really nice start to a non-photosynthetic system. And I've got some of these like dendros in there, or the fathead dendros, and they're doing great. I'm feeding the, I'm feeding them every day, and we put in like some uh, some cleanup crew so that anything that doesn't get eaten gets eaten by them. And then one day I look in there, and, and my serpent starfish that are the cleanup crew down there, they're like dissolving in front of my eyes. They're like losing legs and stuff. I'm like, what the heck, right? <laughs> Just do a water test, see what's going on. Off the charts. We did a 60% water change. Nitrate, off the charts. Sure. So it's over 100, it's still over 100 after a 60% water change. Do another water change. It might be 100. <laughs> and then I'm like siphoning out detritus and we got it down to about 20 something. And then it's probably 50 now. But yeah, we were dissolving cleanup crew. <laughs> yeah, I can say so. Yeah. So, feeding corals, good until you screw it up. So don't screw it up. Be very, very, you know, judicious about the amounts that you feed. It doesn't take a lot of coral food to make a, a big difference. Positive difference in your coral, so don't overdo it. Uh, let's see. Tim, follow up on spot feed questions. What's the best for diaceras plate? Same sort of thing, really. Yeah. Nothing different. Exactly the same. Uh, Gordon Ellis, how's everyone doing? Doing good. Uh, okay, uh, Gordon Ellis again. Finn, will you, will you be at Reef Apalooza in New York this year? Um, if that's the one in June, I will not be. There is a um, an event going on here for my birthday. And so people are flying in from out of town and stuff like that. Um, so I will be missing that one. And that's not one I can skip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, got, I'm kind of central to that event. <laughs> uh, Matt Smoyer, hey B, sorry, was blah, 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 not even talking to me. Okay, that's great. <laughs> oh, yep, yeah, see, be the fountain. Not rap New York. Both Smoyer and I will be at Tidal Gardens that weekend, though I guess I could go to rap and leave us. Oh, I guess Than could go to rap and leave us with Ben and Luke, my, my staff people. That would be a weird birthday party. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a weird birthday weekend, seeing as they don't work on the weekend. Mm -hmm. And the birthday guy went to New York. Exactly. We're all here to celebrate things. Yeah, thanks, thanks for flying in. <laughs> Just have put a picture of you on the wall. <laughs> Happy birthday. Okay, so I understand. Hoping to meet you. Um, so let's see. What what shows am I absolutely okay, as of right this second? I am confirmed for one show. <laughs> I'm confirmed for Reef Stock in Denver. Uh, I'm possibly going to be doing something with like um, maybe an Aquashella. Hopefully an Aquashella at some point this year, and. There was a bunch of others that I wanted to do that are probably not going to happen. Like, I wanted to go to Germany for, like, Interzoo. Oh, so the Interzoos. Those are supposed to be absolutely massive. Yes. I have never been to those. And that, and they only do it every other year, and they're going to do it this year. Oh. And there's talk of going. But what throws a wrench into all this is that my cat now has an asthma medication, and she needs to get an inhaler twice a day. So, uh, I originally was asking my staff if, you know, they would be willing to go into my house and administer, you know, this thing to my cats. My cats scare them. So. <laughs> They're sweet. They're very sweet cats. There's nothing wrong with those two. <laughs> so, they are, like, scared of my cats. So, they're, they're like, we're willing to try, but it's, like, neither here nor there. So I had to go get an actual like pet sitter that used to be like a vet, and she's like absolutely confident. But every single time I leave the house for one of these like weekend shows, 
it's costing me like a hundred bucks just l- stepping out the door, not even including the rest of the travel costs, the hotel, the flights, the parking, the food. It's just like just in cat inhaler twice a day alone. It's for for that for that time period. It's between a hundred to one hundred fifty bucks, depending on how many days. So it's like I have to like really think about it. like do I. Yeah. Am I really going to be booking a cat sitter for this? <laughs> for X amount of days, just to yeah. go out. <laughs> B is like, I forgot about the birthday part. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I've had enough of them. Uh, the more I use Benepets, the more I fall in love with the feeding response. Benepets, very good. We've used it before. We still have some, I believe. Feeding cores in general, I mean, corals puff up, they have bigger, more tissue, they have, of course, yeah. larger polyps. I mean, you can see the benefits of feeding any coral, I mean, anytime. The only, the only, I was about to say, the only thing, the only two things that really stop me from doing a lot more with feeding is do not bork your ecosystem yeah. by overfeeding. That's one thing. But the addicted uh, to feeding, it, and you just toss it in, toss it in, toss and it And then all of a sudden you have 100 nitrate, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. like, all of your cleanup crew is, like, inside out. <laughs> That's not great. Um, but the other thing is, like, you're putting in a very, very nutrient-rich filter feeding or filter feeding food in there, like mm-hmm. powdered food. So a lot of the filter feeders will do really, really well. Some of them you might really like. Some of them you might not like. And all of those are going to go bonkers. They're going to love it. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why I incorporated, because I turn my tank into a snow globe sometimes, to the point where it's just like you can see it and it's just snowing around it, coral food everywhere. But to compensate for that, I have a cryptic refugium with tons of sponges going everywhere. So as the water continuously flows through and through and through, the sponges get fat and happy and they eat all the leftovers and it eventually clears it right up within an hour or so. So... Do you not have any vermidids in your show tank? I do have a few. I do. Okay, because the only small drawback is the vermidids. Well, that's not a small drawback for me. Yeah. Because like if <laughs> if I have like a couple of vermidid snails, and then I snow globe the tank, yeah. I will have a thousand yeah. vermidid snails. It's like it's it's so good at growing <sighs> vermidid snails. It is, and they can eat anything. I've had vermidids yeah. of ours quite. Honestly, I just scrape the glass and just the particles of algae floating around the tank. That's and good enough. They'll grab it. That's that's more than enough. And they'll grab it, and all of a sudden, ooh! And then all of a sudden, you'll see them inch a little longer, and they'll grow a little bit more. And you're like, mm. just cleaning the glass makes them grow. Those yeah. things are absolutely vile. I hate those things. Yeah, and um, so it would be wonderful if so. So uh, I made an entire video on how to uh, get rid of vermitted snails. Mm-hmm. Like, and there's like, and the, the nice thing is like vermitted snails, <laughs> oh, this is awful. Okay, so the, all the different techniques, they are, they, they compound on each other. So if you limit food, if you increase predation, if you manually remove them, if you do all these things, you mm-hmm. can ex- like very heavily control your vermitted snail problem. You can do it, okay? Mm-hmm. But the, the elimination of remitted snails, way more difficult. Yeah. Way more. And Extremely. And in a facility, it ain't happening. Yeah. Because we have... Okay, so th- this is actually a, a, a funny story. I, um, I was listening to uh, a speaker uh, that has like a coral farm. And this is one of the coral farms that says that they have like no pests. And I'm like... BS, right? <laughs> but, 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 let's just, you know, let's just, see. so I just out of, out of curiosity, you know, like somebody had asked, like, how big is your coral farm? Yeah. And there, and this person was like, it's about, you know, did the math, about 600 to 800 gallons. And I'm like, I have more water than that in my pipes. Yeah. That you will never be able to service. Yeah. So, I mean, there's miles of Schedule 80 pipe. It, oh yeah. It goes between building. There's, there's multiple buildings that are connected with piping. Oh yeah, that's right. There, there. Oh. There's a lot of stuff here, right? So the idea that like, oh, you can you know throw in like fifty bumblebee snails, they ain't gonna do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about like you know dipping the rocks in like ivermectin, and that uh, kills it. Of course, I've seen a few of our tests. Of course, using that one, it was directed towards spinoids. Of course, originally, 
Uh-huh. And uh, of course, it's been used on those. But uh, of course, how that's the only issue that we were talking before is just like as Jake called it, biofouling. Any kind of biofouling, which is the vermin that's basically living inside, as far as uh, PVC pipe tubing, anywhere they can just uh, take a foothold. As far as it's, it, you can take care of it in the tank, but what about everywhere else? Everywhere else. And that's the, the biggest issue. I've cleaned out an entire tank, and it just you miss one or two that are in an overflow in a corner, in the back, in an area you just don't look at. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, as far as you're clean for months, and then all of a sudden it comes right on back like seven months later, and you haven't introduced a single thing to your tank. We sometimes will we'll, we'll fully break down a tank and like wipe it dry with a towel and oh, yeah. spray it down with like, you know, with. You with, have to. And we, when, and we fire it back up that same day, put everything <clears throat> back in. And it's, it's mainly just to buy us time, it doesn't mm-hmm. solve anything. Because, yeah. I mean, like, a vermidid snail can be dry for, like, four days. And yeah. Fine. It just closes this little hatch, and as far as it yeah. seals himself up, and he's protected from the world for a little bit, and then when, you know, conditions yeah. are favorable, They come right back the out, and then you hit it with all that powdered food, and it's just like, you know what? It's time to breed. Yeah. Of course, we, I've seen him literally dipped in just pure ROD water. It just left oh, in fresh care. water. They care less. As far as yeah, they don't care about in that. In Bayer, care less just there. like just switch is like just that door just closes shut and they're just like you know what i'll have a little bit of a cough i'm good and then as soon as they're you know they're free of that uh you know pest to insecticide they're gone they're you know open back up again so the, so that kind of got me thinking if you're already taking a rock out to dip it in something could you just like take that that rock and just like set it in the sun yeah you can like, dip it in the sun just like don't you <laughs> you don't even need chemicals of any kind like if you're willing to take your rocks out I mean, if you're going to take the rocks out, I mean, you could even just do an acid bath. Just muriatic acid and just burn their home alive and just basically just yeah. dissolve it from the outside in. Yeah, you could and do then, that too. Then, then it's, yeah, that that'll just kills it. everything. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, reef. Ooh. Okay, hold on. I skipped somebody. Yep. Kevin C. Different LPS corals in tank touching each other, but no signs of stinging aggression. Should I move them as prevention or leave them because they're happy where they are? If it's working for you, I probably wouldn't move them. But generally speaking, I try to give corals as much space as possible. What was that? LPS touching. Oh, LPS touching. And, and so it, far, they're doing okay. It really, yeah. As long, if they're doing okay, I mean. There's nothing. There's certain species you got to be care about and careful about. Like you know, for instance, any kind of micro lords, they're gonna just throw up. You know, or the last Akan, the uh, Enchinata is gonna be. They're just destroying they're, everything around yeah. them overall. But if you have like a, a trachy and some scoli, sometimes those, you know, a lot of times they'll they'll play. They'll be friendly Four to each other. Four different types of hammer doesn't really. Yeah, matter. hammers are just fine. The only one that seems to be a little bit touchy is. A, more touchy than anything else is torches. Torches will torches tend to fight. go after. Yeah, they'll fight other. So, fight. so torches are euphilia. Yeah. Frog spawn hammers fimbriophilia. fimbriophilia. Yeah. And I'm so I, so sometimes I like roll my eyes about like classification stuff. This is helpful to me because yeah. that explains a lot yeah. of stuff. Like, why are torches kind of different? Yeah. It's like if they're all euphilia, why are you specifically? The torches, torches are the, yeah. kind of different. They're more finicky. They're more fighty. They die a lot. Like, yeah. what, what's going on here? Like, I mean, torches, I mean, they'll fight almost anybody, uh, no matter what. I have one who just literally battles against a bubble tip an enemy and will literally latch onto an enemy if we're going to tentacles and just stick them. And em. stick them. Yeah. And, and I've seen them on. rip with, to the point where the enemy has to pull back, rips off the tentacle, and the torch pulls it in, and it's just kind of, then it's just hanging onto the torch. And an enemy just backs off because the torch is such a for as a <laughs> opponent to it. Yeah, and uh, like this this hammer that's on screen. Like I've absolutely had a torch reach over, just grab on. Oh, easily, yeah, easily. And, and and there was a time where people were like, "Yeah, you could keep them touching, but you know these mm. seem to kind of be not loving it." But you can do it. Yeah, and a lot of times when they when I see them do that, it's used like a brand new torch that's just still settling in. It doesn't have all its, as far as, you know, nematocysts, any stinging cells ready to attack. Mm-hmm. So he's just kind of putting up with it until he can kind of build it up a little bit more. And then he's like, all right, I'm ready. And I'm just going to kill you now and get rid of the competition. We uh, we have a kind of like this, what was called the Euphilia show tank downstairs. You've seen it. Mm-hmm. Um, we, and we did have torches in there along with hammers and frog spawn. Uh, and one day it was like those torches chose violence, and it's like, 
all of you guys got to go. We kicked out every single torch <laughs> up and out of there. I believe it, 100%. Yeah, and now it's a Fimbriophilia only Euphilia show tank. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Reef with me wanted your opinion on my next nano. In a, okay, so I know nothing about these. Innovative Marine, UNS, Title 55. Oh, with a Title 55. Oh, hang on. Oh, HOB, okay. hang on. So, back. Innovative oh. Marine or UNS. I don't know anything about these tanks. I've used Innovative Marine. Uh, for okay. Us. Stephanie said a queen uh, for us, Innovative Marine. We used to move that top shelf. It's a great all-in-one. Uh, pretty for a standard across the board for design-wise, for the overflow, return, compartments for media and so forth. UNS, I think, isn't that the company? That's the new company, the guys in California. Yeah, they're in, in California. They do fresh water. They don't do salt water. No, they just started they, doing salt. Yeah, they just started doing salt. So if you go to their page or anything, you won't find... Whoop, we lost everybody. Screensaver. It's a beautiful screen. Oh, yeah. There we go. And We're back. I don't know much about as far as the design of the, the tank itself. I'm assuming it's a standard all-in-one, of course, with overflow return. I can't imagine them doing too much different. Um, but I've seen their freshwater, and their freshwater looks phenomenal. They just are just dipping their toes into the saltwater world, uh -huh. as far as I know. How different really are all these all-in-ones? I am curious. Honestly, I haven't seen I too many, too much difference. A lot of times, I mean, they're just, they moved their compartment here and there. They've made the overflow maybe slightly bigger or added an extra return for <clears throat> additional flow from the return. Some have ones where... They'll have return of overflows on each end, mm -hmm. so it captures more from each individual side with the return coming through the center. I have seen it in a beta be like that before, but yeah, a lot of them is still rimless tank, pane of glass or acrylic in the back. That's where the, the filter is, mm -hmm. and then the back compartments are just very different sizes. So the little um, the little all in one that we have uh, was a gift to us from uh, Reef Casa. And that's like the first all-in-one that I've really ever messed with. I, I don't see a lot of ways to make these things that different. Like you're, you're, yeah. you're really just talking I, about like the smallest I details. All-in-ones are great as far as for you're starting a tank up and so forth, but I can't really see too many ways of changing the design. There's just not, there's just not a lot of room to change yeah. it, right? Unless you're adding some kind of automated equipment automatically attached inside the filter that's pre-made for that space but that's the only few things i can think of that could be different like a, like maybe adding a space specifically designed for a, like a miniature roller mat that would just roll in the back up or something something small and innovative that no one's ever done that's like the but, size of a battery yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like so you three inches plug right in yeah Ugh. i think that there's a lot of people that are uh that are getting into that all-in-one market like, oh, I know yeah. that, that the, like, it's not bulk reef supply, but it's bulk mm. reef supply. Like, was it, like, my nano or something? Uh, it's something like that. So, something I like that. Think of it. But so, so they launched their all-in-one. Obviously, like, you know, my friend March up in Canada started the Reef Casa. He's doing the all-in-one thing. Mm -hmm. And then you know, Innovative Marine and UNS have all-in-ones. I'm sure there's many others yeah. at, at, at different price points. I mean, there have been so many over the years, from BioCube to, I mean, you name it, from yeah. adding Liz to Rimless. But, yeah. If you guys carry nudie a Bergia nudie bronx or peppermint shrimp, I will buy them and pick them up like now. <laughs> Aptasia problem. Uh, we don't have any Bergias now, but we do. Uh, we we do hope to get some more farmed up in a bit here. Um, believe it or not, it's hard to farm Aptasia when you really need to farm a lot of Aptasia. It's a lot harder than you think. Because. They eat them instant, like yeah. Once once the bergias go, there you go. all all your oh, aptasias yeah. are gone, no matter how many you have. Oh yeah, they devour them like there's it's like it's nothing. In like two days. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we reference to that. Don't buy them at the same time. 
Stop buying peppermints and burgias at the exact <laughs> same time. The peppermints will eat your burgias. I've seen plenty of people buy both, thinking that they're going to demolish their aptasia. Oh, they're all gone. And then all of a sudden, the burgias are missing for months. It's because the pe peppermints will devour the burgias. Try one and then the other <laughs> before you. So, yeah, this is the, one of the tricks that we had to learn um, with, like, breeding burgias is that we have to kill all the crustaceans. Like, amphipods eat the burgias and eat their eggs and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's a thing. But once you do that, boom, aptasia gone. Oh, yeah. For in Stephanie's, we had a multitude of aptasia, especially in the sump where there was just some extra live rock down there, and mm -hmm. there was no life whatsoever for the most part, except for Aptasia. It was a wall of Aptasia. The Burgias got down to the bottom, into the display tank, and they took out every last one of them. It was yeah. gone, just almost like waking up one morning. It's like a Christmas morning, and all the Aptasias are finally gone, and the corals are all happy because nothing's stinging them. Yeah. They are phenomenal. The Aptasia come back after a few months, but it buys you so much time. Yeah, and it's usually a couple, and if you're lucky enough, you can find them, you can really start, you know, eliminating them. But yeah. Yeah, they can definitely they can definitely resurface. And you know, if you're if you're part of like a reefing community or a club of some sort, like do your friends in the club a solid. Like once your burgias are basically starving from from no more aptasia, pass the love along, you know, yeah. and just help eradicate. So like when when whenever we uh, do our burgia farming stuff, uh, oop, um, whenever we do our aptasia farming stuff. We will obviously we will sell off a bunch of them, and then when we're, we're getting to that end point, we'll just take all the remainders and just spread them out all over our systems. Mm -hmm. They like whatever whatever aptasia that we had are going to get mowed down. Yep. And then several months down the road, <laughs> they pop up again. We start to farm the aptasia in our aptasia <laughs> farm slowly, because I'm telling you, when you when you have to grow aptasia. Harder than you think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Harder than you think. And, uh, yeah, and then, so then we get the, we get the Bergias going again, and then we unleash it like a wildfire, <laughs> and then just start the process over. So, yeah. I mean, do we have Aptasia? abso freaking lootly. They're not that easy to find, typically, here. Sometimes you can run out. I've run out of Aptasia trying to grow Bergias. And then I've even it called all the time. friends and, like, said, hey, do you have any aptasia left? Or any? Like, no. Therefore, my burgers ate them all. So mm -hmm. I'm calling even stores and local fish stores. Hey, I know this is a really weird question. I'm not looking for corals or fish or any kind of dry goods. Do you have aptasia? And like, of course we have no aptasia. No, no, no. No, I'm, no, no, I'm, no, no. Tell really, me the truth. <laughs> I really, really want some. <laughs> like, like, this is not a, a prank call. I really want to buy some. I'll pay you for some extra if you have any. It's like, no, no, don't give me the propaganda <laughs> yeah. answer, comrade. Like, I just need to, I need to know because I actually want these things. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I ship to Europe? We do not. U.S. only. Shipping overseas is a very different business. Mm -hmm. A lot of paperwork, a lot of, you know, yeah. things to sign. I just thought it's a lot of money. Yes. It's a lot of money. Thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. Dangles, branching Cyphastria tips? Hmm. Not really. I guess it depends on what you want to do. Are you just trying to grow it? Or are you trying to color it up to a specific thing? Because, so branching Cyphastria, it's kind of funny. Uh, there's like a couple of different color morphs mm -hmm. of the branching Cyphastria. It's literally all the same stuff that's just grown to a different color. When we first got um, the, the a branching Cyphastria called like a cactus cooler, it was basically like a meteor shower cyphastria in coloration. It's got like the teal base, red polyp. That's the classic one. Yeah. yeah. We turned it solid pink um, for years. And now it's slowly turning back to that original meteor shower looking thing. And <laughs> the entire time we had to like, so this, this is also like a struggle that we had because I hate naming something two different things. <laughs> okay, I freaking hate it. Like, cause, it, so, I there, there's a couple of like competing ideologies going on. One of them is, oh, it's scammy because you're saying that these these are two different products. Right? Yeah. But 
sometimes if you sell the same product, that could be two completely different yeah. things at any given time. Absolutely. Now you run into the issue of, wait a minute, no. I bought the cactus cooler that was teal based red polyp and what you sent me was all pink exactly and then when you say no 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 no, <laughs> it's literally that you just have to color it up differently and yes. your tank is like no no no, but that's not what i bought right? mm -hmm. so then it's like no, no no we're gonna have a cactus cooler then we're gonna have a pink siphastry <laughs> that's branching yeah. and then now you're like kind of like going in the other direction where it's like man this is just a cactus cooler <laughs> i had that already I was looking for a pink one. Exactly. Because if it can be morphs or if it's just because of the color of your light so far as it changes a color in your tank, think of metal halide. All the colors of corals from prior until now under LEDs, the slight shift in the change yeah. of colors. You're telling me it's this color coral? It's not that coral anymore. It's this brand new coral that we have to change. Right, and then we're not even, so like uh, on, on this live stream, we're literally showing a color change going from like daylight to actinic. But that's not even what I'm talking about in the display of a coral. We're talking about the coral itself completely mm -hmm. changing its, its, its appearance. And uh, oh, that absolutely. particular variety of Cyphastria can completely be a different coral. Because if it's not a WYSIWYG, and you're just buying just a regular frag, yeah. and it's the same cactus coral, they're going, this is not what I ordered. Right. I wanted the solid pink one. And you yeah. gave me the one with the blue and the pink. Yeah. That's not the right one. And uh, it's, a, it's a good point <clears throat> that you mentioned about like how like the, the different tank conditions can drastically change these corals. Because one mm -hmm. time I went to, this was like way back when I was just a hobbyist. So this was a <laughs> while ago, guys. Uh, I, I went to this guy's place, and he was selling some like, um, some Recordia, Recordia mm -hmm. Florida. Mm -hmm. And I actually had like a nice little collection of Recordia Florida. I love them. He had this velvety purple one. Super nice velvety purple one. And I'm like, that's awesome. I definitely don't have that color morph. I want that for my collection. I bought it, put it in my tank, and sure enough, all of my other ones are like blue and turquoise, and then there's like this velvety purple one. Amazing. <laughs> Three weeks later, it is exactly like my other ones. Oh, God. <laughs> Just different tank conditions. Oh, absolutely. I've done that myself. I went to the Florida Frag Swap, and, of course, Recordia, first, they are from Florida. They're in Caribbean. You can get them. You can find them growing in the wild in Key West. And so down in South Florida, people grow them outside. Of course, of course, makes sense. So I went to the Florida Frag Swap, and I saw one, and I've never seen one as puffy and as big and fat and fluffy ever. And I was like, I gotta have this. This is before the show even opened. I was like, before anybody gets this, how much do you want for this recording? I have to have it. And found out later, this one was just, was grown outside under the sun in a Rubbermaid tub. And for some reason, he would take them, just toss them, chuck them in this giant tub, and they would just blossom just into these massive, I put it in my system, at first, it stayed nice and fluffy for a little while, and then slowly just matched every other recordia. It's still beautiful. Same, yep, same <laughs> experience. Did not have the same fluff and had that oomph that I had before, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that, that's kind of part of it, you know. And so I, um, the other day, there was like a local, uh, local customer, and this is me being like the best customer service person ever. Right. This person was looking at some acros and he asked, uh, so if I buy these, they'll stay this color in my tank. Right. And me being the extremely sensitive customer service person, I was like, that's a terrible question. <laughs> you are asking the wrong question entirely. This coral is not for you if that is what you're worried about, <laughs> because like we need to back it up. Number one, hopefully you don't kill this thing. Number two, there's almost no chance that you're going to keep these colors. <laughs> it's like if you're asking that question, no, you it's, will not keep these colors. It's possible. There is a chance you'll keep the colors. But there's also... Not if you're asking that question. <laughs> no, there's not. Ain't no, it, ain't, it ain't happening. It's like, it's like certain corals are so sensitive to everything that good or bad, they're going to change color. Mm-hmm. Like, whenever I order Acropora from online, like, from, like, highly reputable people with really nice collections, collections that you've probably heard of, um, whenever I get them, 
my expectation is pretty much what I get, which is a bunch of brown corals. And I know for a fact, they did not leave that guy's place last night brown. Yeah. They turn brown overnight. They get into my quarantine setup. They're going to be brown for months. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it is. And that's a really tricky thing to kind of explain to customers that are that have never bought an acro before. Yeah. It's like, guys, anything you do to this coral is going to change its color, including shipping it. And even from the time when you cut the frag, you glue it to the frag plug, and then it starts to encrust a little bit, it can completely change color the overall. Mm-hmm. For as uh, Latistellus, Acropora Latistella, those corals were itself, when you cut the frag from the branch, because when it's in a colony, you have yellow polyps, a nice purple, beautiful base, and you put it down the frag, you glue it, it'll settle in just enough, it won't encrust just yet, and it still have those colors of your main colony. You give it a few weeks, and all of a sudden the encrustment starts going. And as soon as the encrustment is going, that almost a green growth ring starts turning green, the entire branch. Then the customer will get it and you'll get, it's just a green branch. It looks nothing like the original photo because it's had time to settle in. Before you purchased it, by the time we sold it, it was already starting to encrust. And it turned into like an encrusting phase to the point where I've sold that coral before and I've had had to take time light shots. So uh, over several weeks of it going from the original frag with beautiful yellow coral lights down to purple, down to yellowish green. And then finally, when it finally encrusted over the entire plug and new little branches started popping out, it started reverting back to the original of our coral when they, the one they wanted. It just takes time sometimes. Yeah. And it's that species. Yeah. Acros aren't one of those things that you can be that persnickety about. It's, like that's a lot of user error. In, in, it's, it's like, uh, there are hundreds of threads on any platform Mm -hmm. discussing how to bring out colors in acros. Yes. That is not for, for funsies. It's because it's that hard. And it will be different for everybody. Yeah. Of course, everybody will have different types of colors. I mean, you think about the zeovit type corals and those are just all pastel. As far as there are no deep, dark, richer mm-hmm. colors, there's almost no nutrients. And then, of course, the next Acropora guy will have just phosphates and nitrates just through the roof. And it's just deep, dark, but the growth is a little bit is lower and the encrustment is a different color. So that's why there's, gonna be, there's always will be threads on Acropora that are going to change colors. And mine's different than yours. And the colors, what, how many nutrients do you have in your tank? What kind of lighting are you using? Mm-hmm. Those are all the questions those Acropora guys always ask. They're like, Right off the bat. Yeah, and sometimes, it, like the, uh, so this is a, a thing that that um, that Ryan from Bulk Reef and and I have have talked about, because like his his like hill to die on lately mm-hmm. is about lighting, because he is he hates the the the, well he hates this argument around metal halide, mm. being like god tier lighting and like. Metal halide is the best lighting ever, blah, blah, blah. It's magical. He's like, there's nothing magical about photons. Like, the <laughs> photons are there or they are not there. There's, yeah. there's, no, there's no such thing as a magic photon. There could be aspects of metal halide yes. that are very, very good, but that can eventually be replicated in LED. Yes. And blah, 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 right? So, but even if you're using, like, the same light as somebody else, a lot of like what um, goes into the implementation of those lights is going to matter tremendously because just taking, uh, let's say you have four radions. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows what a radion is, right? If you take four radions and shine them directly down, mm-hmm. it's going to be different than if you took all four of them and kind of like tilted them towards the middle. Oh, absolutely. Because you're like... It's, it's, Angle change, especially with LED, is a big, big difference. Oh. Just to try to remove shadows. And no one talks about that nowadays. I always wonder why that, because a lot of times people are always talking about the angle of the LED and how much spread it gets. Back in the day, like in the 90s as far as, or early 2000s, it was all about the reflectors, how much light we can get from the sides and scatter inwards. Yes. And, and then you would have, you know, as far as uh, VHOs, you would have those angled inwards. But nowadays, oh, it's just a coverage. But I don't really no, care. No, because it's because beam angle means you're still going to get shadow. Exactly. Yeah. But no one talks about that nowadays. I don't understand. It's but, like disappeared. Especially considering that a lot of the, the lights are like puck based. Yeah. 
And so you're still going to get like directional cone and the the angle of it is not it's not like the, a VHO bulb that they're trying to like replicate with like lenses and stuff. Yeah, like exactly. a VHO bulb wraps around all the surfaces. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And they, you could buy there were companies dedicated just having reflectors that wrapped around mm -hmm. the VH bulb to capture light in every single direction and then shoot it back into the tank. Yeah. One other thing, and and so so Brandy in chat, this is a, a, a an article that we should probably look up for uh, for reef receipts, but there's a thing about you know how like glitter lines mm -hmm. in, in in the reef. Yep. So a, a lot of the aesthetic now is going away from that glittery look, that mm -hmm. Kessel look. Yeah. Right, and it's going more towards like the blanket VHO yeah. look, where it's just just consistent. Yeah blanket of purple or blue right <laughs> top to bottom everywhere yeah so there's an article or a research journal about the effect of glitter lines on coral biology really where a lot of their evolution really did depend on like the change from uh, like the, the 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 hills and valleys and ridges of that light intensity. So mm. during like some of those ripples, yeah. it's 10 times the light versus the area right next to it as it's moving across a coral. Yeah. And that um, supposedly has like a really big biological difference in coral. So a part of the reason why a light like a metal halide might have had like, a more discernible effect versus an LED, especially the ones now that are kind of trying to be more of like a blanket of light, is that they lack glitter lines. Where it's like a metal oh, halide is like glitter, glitter, glitter. You know, oh, just like, every, like yeah. crazy. Right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Point source light, you know, agitation on the surface. The whole thing is like a strobe light effect, practically. Yeah. And that is, that, I think according to that publication, again, Brandy, we should, we should look into that. Um, curious i want to read that one yeah it, it, but it was like this whole thing talking about like how how that affects coral biology i wouldn't be surprised and and again that is one of those things that like you know it might not be for our aquarium aesthetic that we like but you know for for the coral biology aspect of it you might want to have like that more of like a, that kessel look to your water huh. See, these are the kind of things that when people bring up these kind of topics that I'm going to later in your home in two weeks, I'm going to be in the garage, like hanging from the ceiling, trying to for us to add different type of lights because I'm going to try to experiment with multiple different things because I got, I have to know sometimes. <laughs> and, and you know what's weird? Like there's certain trends that like that, that certain um, things pop up and never really catch on. But mm -hmm. now I think that they were on the right track all along. So back in like the, I don't know, early 2000s, maybe into the 90s. There was like uh, there were these tanks. They're called like Japanese tanks. It sounds okay. familiar. Okay. And th you know they look stunning. They have like you know weird cardinal fish in them and stuff like that. Whatever. But then you look at their lighting systems, and their lighting systems looked like a space battleship of random like concert lighting, where they might mm. have what looks like. So like you know like a, like the form factor of I don't know like a single puck LED sort of thing. Yeah. But they're not LEDs back then. They're probably metal halides. Yeah. Right. But they're like yeah. laser beam focused type stuff with VHOs and everything. Mm, okay. But their but their metal halide beam lights are like coral specific. Oh. They're like all adjustable. Directional. Like to yeah. The exact. Mm. Yeah, and so. You, you, so they kind of have this 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 coverage thing going on where they're hitting these corals from like all the relevant yeah. angles. So you're getting complete coverage over right. the entire back. Front, Not left, just right. like a square footage thing where like one light covers twenty four by twenty four. It's like yeah. no, it really doesn't. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Don't give me. Yeah. That's that's one of my soft spots. It's like that. Oh yeah. It covers everything. Like mm, it doesn't. Mm, or like about that. The, the shadow. No, it doesn't. It covers right where it's hitting. And that, yeah. Kinda. It's not. At that specific beam angle. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, this is actually a funny thing that they're going back to uh, the, the Jake Adams stuff, right? So Jake is kind of in that camp of it's coverage. Coverage is coverage. No, oh, okay. And because he was gonna, uh, he was gonna ask me about like, okay, you have some 500 gallon systems that have 10 wide angle LEDs 
fixtures over top. Mm-hmm. Like, why? You could have done with half of that. I'm like, that's true. I could have done with <clears> half of <throat> that. But I don't because I, I have it lifted higher, and coverage is not just coverage. You need angle. Mm-hmm. And just to have that much more angle is is the real value oh, yeah. in all that. Even for me, if it, it all started for me just from the sun. As far as you go to the beach and as far as you would see the sun's cross the sky and it covers, you know, part of your body would be be shadowed. And then the, after, the other part of the half the afternoon, the other half of your body would be shadowed. A, a tree gets from side to side just as it passes over, just like a, a dial, a sundial. You can see the shadow move across so the entire side gets it for different t- amounts of light. That's that rem- what got me down that rabbit hole a long time that, ago. No, that reminds me. Have you, have you ever done like a motorized light system? Yes. Okay. Way I've back never, in the I, day. I never have. So Sun Supply, it was, I think it was, was a company, yeah. and you would get Sun, a little motorized, Sunlight Supply. and it would just go back and forth, yeah. and you would move the metal headlight back and forth across it, and you would just, it would go, it would go very slowly, mm-hmm. and it sounded like a toy car, like little electric motors moving, and you would move it back and forth, and it just covered the entire Yeah, pole. it's a horticultural product. Yeah. And they're not even, they're not cheap, they're like 400 bucks or something. They still sell them? I think they do. I haven't seen them in so long. I, I to this day... Don't know why that never caught on. I mean, I was. I bet that is like fantastic, especially now that we have LEDs that have like, oh yeah, angle problems. There was only one, and there was only two stores back in Florida who had them, and they were just, and they had brought them over from because the gardening section of ours they had, and they quite literally had them going over the corals mm-hmm. back and forth. And the corals had growth on, you know how birds' nests tend to die around the inside yeah. of that. Their birds' nest was the size of a basketball. And it was alive inside, outside, all the way around. And the whole thing was, and this was, uh, I never knew the, the owner's name. We just called him the pirate because he had a patch on one eye. You just, it was, it was like, he's got his beach ball size. Very sensitive. <laughs> Sorry, it just, it, that was the nickname that everybody local gave him at the time. <laughs> it's like Captain Bird's Nest. <laughs> we just did Because just no one knew his name half the time. And it was like, what's his name? I don't know. And just, yeah. I don't know. Jack Sparrow. <laughs> Um, yeah, but that's like one of those things that I, I, back in the day, people did that to save on electricity because like, you know, it's a metal halide. Yeah. I could buy four metal halides or I could buy one metal halide in a motorized track. That's what he was, his reasoning was. He goes, I can put a smaller one Mm -hmm. and I can get the coverage. I don't have to buy bunches of them. Yeah. It made sense. And now I'm like. We had the answer back then, probably. Probably. (laughs) Uh, yeah, interesting. Okay, sorry, chat. I've ignored you for about an hour, but we went on uh, a little, uh, a little, a little journey, a little journey. Okay. Um, aquatic interests. What's the worst coral for stinging and sweeper tentacles in your experience? Um, Ooh. Uh, Galaxia. Is Galaxia. Bad. Gal- that's that's number one. I just couldn't. Yeah, Galaxia is. I, 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 I was like. I was, I was gonna say like hydnophore, but I meant galaxia. Yeah. Hydnophore is bad as well. Galaxia. They're, they're the worst. Yeah, they had yeah. they're the size and the, the sting yeah. of them. They just it's like pound for pound destroy the meanest thing, and so that that's kind of like a, like clownfish or pound for pound the meanest fish. Uh, galaxia is pound for pound oh, yeah. the meanest coral. Absolutely. <sighs> Let's see. What's the best way to get a Bubble tip to move off of it. Uh, a bubble tip is going to do whatever a bubble tip wants. Yeah, I mean, you can try to get it off. Some people use ice. Some people use little aerators. I use my finger. As far as I just get a little part of the, the foot. And just gently and scrape it away. Gently, as far as just massage a little bit and on the foot until it finally slowly starts peeling, peeling, peeling and off. But be careful with the zoas because then you're going to tick the zoas off. Yeah. That's not going to be fun. <laughs> Pink branching cyphastria, just looking to grow mine. But man, I love a meteor shower version. You have a meteor shower version. <laughs> uh, are you going to have a reef to reef auction like in April? So I don't know about April specifically, but I think that we have like a few on the on that that we will be doing. We paid the big bucks for those. Why is it on both sides? Okay, something something reef to reef sales. You don't have to go to reef to reef. It's right now, guys. It's happening right now. <laughs> there um, are corals being posted as we speak. As we speak. Drafted Sunfire and Montipore right now. Yeah. <laughs> item 168. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 169 now. Great Montipore. There we go. 
Oh, that's a good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time delayed. Live. Uh, okay, so let's see. What genus gives the best brain coral globe look? Ooh. Interesting question. So, what do you think? I'll let you answer first. I mean, Fabius have been named as far as brain coral before, but I like her answer is Wilsonia. Wilsonia is because they have the lobe in there. Australophilia Wilsoni. Those will, yeah. Those will definitely have a really nice, like, actual brain looking to them. So I'm going to give you my non-answer. So um, there's uh, a type of maize brain coral called an oleophilia. And I agree that I like the Australophilia wilsoni and I like oleophilia. Over time, in a well-fed aquarium, both of those end up looking like trachees. Mm. Like we have, we have some Wilsonis downstairs that have no maze brain look anymore to them. They just look like giant red trachees. But I'm guessing they're only about two to three polyps big. Uh, they're about like the size of my hand. Hmm. Cause I've seen ones. That, I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause we, I've we fragged. I've fragged ones down that are only about three to four polyps total. Yeah. And they, the lobes just get so yeah. fluffy, and they look like a small trachea. Right. Or, or, but mine look like big yeah. trachea. Yeah, oh yeah. And they're like big trachees now. <laughs> and so they'll and so for ours like they never regain that 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 tight, that tight maze. Because uh, they're just not they're just not. They're so poopy enough. and they're just so big. Yeah. yeah. So I saw them downstairs. They do look like they do look like trachees. Like yeah. 100%. So so I would say a platygyra. Oh yeah. Platygyra yeah. is a definitely a really good one. Yeah, because they, they they tend to stay smaller and they, they tend to keep that maze brain worm worm brain look. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. This is why genotype is better for identification than phenotype, and why coral taxonomy has changed so much in recent years. Yeah. Goniastria. It's another suggestion. Ryan has talked about the glass being important for reflecting light, that people need to clean their glass. But I think that gets lost in all the other information. So that's, that's like the internal reflection yeah. back. Yeah, the internal reflection. Just like when you look on one side, you see your, your reflection of the, like a mirror on the on like the side panels. Mm -hmm. All that. I've heard him talk just a little bit about it, where it hits the glass and comes right off. But we mm -hmm. have algae, of course, it's absorbing all the light and taking. Yeah, it in. but at the same time, like who doesn't clean their glass to the, to the point where? Because some people don't, some people don't, and then you got those people who have just straight core line in the back. Yeah. So the whole back panel is all just, just one just my big big giant pink. Like yeah. cupcake that's just all the way in the back of it. A cupcake. <laughs> oh, I, it's a person that popped up. I was like, is, what kind of cupcakes are you eating? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I've got like a three foot sheet of cupcake. <laughs> of icing just on the back of the, the back of the tank. Yeah. <laughs> We're chewing through this live show. It's like we only have about a half hour left, y'all. That was so, quite quick. Yeah. So real quick, I will say my my thank yous and hellos to. Uh, to the supporters of this channel. So we have Polyp Lab, the official corporate sponsor of Tyler Gardens. Um, so, okay, before I get into the names, I, I often joke about like the, the whole sponsorship thing here. In a perfect world, I would love to have like non aquarium sponsors that people like legit don't care about. Like, <laughs> a I shaving want, company, I want, or uh, you know. <laughs> okay, hold, hold on. I have been hit up by Manscaped. Oh really? For for a thing, and they're like, it's like we we could have like a, a fun promotional thing, and I'm like, I don't think that I can make this work, and and then they said, how does eighty dollars sound? I'm like, it doesn't sound like anything. No. It's like we're moving on, and then I I was joking about like, uh, you know what? I would take that Raid Shadow Legends money for like the you know the app, the yeah. you know the, the 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 gotcha game, and then they actually came and reached out to me, and I'm like. I can't do it. <laughs> so so now my go tos is I want I want a DeWalt sponsorship. Oh. I want a Sherwin Williams sponsorship. Oh, that'd be good. That'd and, be real good. And sure we'll keep Polyp Lab around. Because you know, we, we like Phil and we feel bad for nearly killing him. But anyway. It's the guilt. Uh, okay, so the YouTube members, Carlos Fernandez, thank you. Chris Jordan, Steven thirteen, Mike Downey, Keith Holland, Terry Kuhn, Herb seven seven seven. Justin Harden and Ohio Ventures. And on the Patreon side, we have Elaine Martinassi, Aline Barley, Alan Jackson, and Lewis, Brandy Camp, be, that's be the fountain in chat, uh, Chad Admire, Greg, Greg Zimmerman. There, there used to be three different Gregs. 
uh, Harkins Aquatics, Jordan Marty, Kate Singer, Kyle Jameson, Leah Whitmarsh Laddie, Lisa Clow, Lacry Fine Art, Lynn Holt, Puddle Aquatics, Ryan Baker, Scott Williams, Skylar Korn, Sue Hammonds, Thomas Tarrant, and Tim Garner. Thank you all so much for your support. Love ya. All right. Matt started laughing when you said, who doesn't clean their glass? <laughs> <laughs> there are some. I've seen ones there. Oh, boy. Is that a fish swimming by? You just see shadows behind it. It's, like, what, what, it's like, what is that? It's like a green cube. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, that's my fish tank. You'd be surprised. Bro. Uh, let's see. Union Royal Pet and Talmadge and Aquatic Technology both have Bugesi Peppermint Shrimp in stock. Bugesi? As of yesterday. Not Wondermai? Wondermai is usually ones for... Those are the baby. Caribbean ones. I wonder if the Bugesi are the ones... I just noticed that in Europe right now, they're using a different type of peppermint shrimp. There's a bunch of different and types. I didn't know... Oh, yeah, there's a different bunch of different types, but that one specifically looks completely different than any Caribbean or any of the uh, Atlantic species all overall. I wonder if that's the one. Huh. We could look it up. We have the internet. So let's see. <laughs> Bogesi shrimp. Huh? Oh, look at that. Pe- okay. It looks like a peppermint shrimp to me. Yeah. It's not <laughs> a wonder by that. It doesn't look. Yeah. Latimer says Bogesi. I never heard of the Bogesis being as the Aptasia destroyer. It's always the wonder. Or wonder I, I can never pronounce it correctly. Wonder money. Wonder, wonder money. Yeah. yeah other ones. like that. I even have a photo with seven different species that are listed. You can look in the back and you can see. I keep it harder than my favorites in my phone. And one of them is like a camel shrimp. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the camel shrimp. Oh, God. I haven't seen those in forever. And where are these things from? The majority of these ones, as far as that I know of, they're all from they're all from the same area. They're all from either the central, they're either from the Caribbean or from southern florida so i know uh, yeah i knew that yeah those wonder were, many that's what it was. but um the one that was in that publication that you hate um the one about eating uh, like the the acro f- eating flatworm eating shrimp that one yeah uh that is a australian I don't one hate, i know it's a, yeah, i don't hate it it's just i was i had a little frustration around it as far as their methods and materials their in their theories and how they came about it that's all I'm not saying it was bad it was still very well good <laughs> yeah it made me want to add peppermint shrimp it's just that when you're when i'm trying when i'm trying to solve a problem in a tank and i'm trying to use a natural for way of forest doing it so i'm using peppermint shrimp i try to find out say for aptasia i try to find out their locale in the ocean and as far as what is their natural predator in that location but trying to find a separate species that are in a different part of the world that may eat something that's on this part of the world it's a it seems like it's a lot harder of course, okay. to, for it to affect. But if you go to that same location, something in that location will probably have the most closest predator that or targets that particular species. And instead of trying to find a species that's somewhere else. That's all. That's what I, I usually try to do. But wouldn't wouldn't that make their research more valid? Because they were taking um, like Pacific shrimp, like uh, Austral- Australian shrimp. Mm-hmm. And eating flatworms off of what I thought were Australian corals. Well, to get, for that species of, of flatworm, the majority of our species of flatworms here in the States are usually from Indo. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Because I know there are a few different species of agri flatworms. And yeah. I think, as far as I know, one of the most common ones are the ones from Indo, not from... I mean, there's definitely overlap, cause, yeah. but I'm just saying. Okay. I was just thinking, because the different species... Because I've caught a few different agri flatworms. And mm-hmm. I've compared pictures, and they're, they're definitely different species, size-wise, textures, mm-hmm. as far as, I mean, even the, the bite marks are slightly different shaped. It would not surprise me if there's, like, a cornucopia of different flatworms that eat yeah. like acros at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, we, we don't... Knock on wood. The nudie bronc? We, uh... The acridy nudie bronc? We are doing okay on the... <laughs> acro nudie or uh, on the acro flatworm <laughs> side of things yeah no that's a frustrating one to deal with though like they just hang around the eggs just hang around 
Like, do, or do, do, I wonder sometimes on the the nudies that eat the money eating nudies because you think you would get rid of them after a while. You haven't seen any in a while, and they'll just pop up out of nowhere and they'll come back to life. I wonder if some of the eggs purposely stay dormant for X amount of time and Very then likely. they hatch. And I wonder if that's a temperature thing because it's almost like like the seasonality comes around. Like you know, come springtime, we are on high alert. Yeah. Because it's like you know, after after the winter and everything is looking great, like come that first really warm day, mm-hmm. it's that's like I get ultra suspicious, <laughs> and, and I'm like, guys, keep your eye open for anything. If anything moves, we're dipping this whole system. Yeah, <laughs> like if you see a flicker move. Yeah, it's gone. like anything because it's like I guess it's one of those things where like, we haven't seen a blank in X months or years. It's like yeah. We will wait till May. May first <laughs> comes around, and it's like I don't trust nothing. You're putting it on the calendar of our doomsday, just to exit yeah. it off, circle it's like around. The, 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 it's like as soon as we see like a 78 degree day, it's like it's time to kill everything. <laughs> but but yeah, it, it's kind of like that. It's a, it's it's one of those things where like you know you think that you've beaten something, and you haven't literally haven't seen it in a long long mm-hmm. time, and we haven't added anything. It's like we stopped buying Montipora years ago like i don't i believe it i don't remember who was president the last time he bought a montipora <laughs> like because it, it's just one of those things and for a longest time like you know um like my mom or like some of the staff members would be like we really like this monty and i'm like listen every monty you buy mm-hmm. is putting our entire collection at risk yes it's just about every wild caught monty has nudie bronx something as, as yeah <laughs> An but egg, an adult, a juvenile, something, something's right. on there. So I'd say every single time, like, guys, you're putting the entire collection at risk mm-hmm. every single time. And and we have enough. We have, like, I don't know, 40 different types of money. That's good enough. Yeah. We don't need any more. And so we really haven't bought any, anything else. And so that's allowed us to, like, to really control that stuff. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that everything is just gone. Like, like I said, uh, like, or like you said. Some of these things just might pop back up. Yeah. Out of, out of thin air, no new introductions. Yeah. I've, heard, I've seen tanks that are been bare and just haven't had a single coral, a cleanup crew, a crab, a snail, not for months on end. Mm-hmm. Everything's growing great. And then all of a sudden, you just go by the tank and you're feeding, you're like, what's that? And just something catches your eye and like, there's like a little like dead mark. You're like, oh, that wasn't there. And then all of a sudden, you do an inspection and before you know it, there's a little cluster of eggs, and there's an adult just roaming around. So, so it's, wild. it's it's absolutely insane. You know, the craziest story that I've heard, or not, not even heard, I saw it, like, firsthand. I was helping a friend move a large aquarium to a much larger aquarium, okay? So it's yeah. one of those deals, right? Yeah. A tank upgrade time. <laughs> and so it went from – it was kind <clears> of interesting – he went from like a 200 something gallon tank to like a 500 ish t- t- gallon tank, something like that. Oh, wow. Okay. Good size. All the same fish, all the same rock, all the same sand, all the uh, same mm-hmm. rock, all the same coral. Had an Aptasia outbreak. Like, why? Why? It could have been that one solo that no one had seen for ages that was like probably in the back of the tank in a little hole and just minding its own business, living its life. Then all of a sudden the disturbance said, oh no, I'm this, this, I may, I may perish. I need to spread my, my genes everywhere. And all of a sudden they just pop yeah. up everywhere. So added nothing new, oh, God. took the same stuff and yeah, out of nowhere, he had a thing. Yeah. There, there's some, there's some strange, strange events that happen every now and again. Oh yeah. I've seen people as far as have a brand new tank, absolutely nothing, barren, sterile, get their first cleanup crew, and all of a sudden the entire glass is covered in tadpoles. There's actually a, of course, a parasite that completes its life cycle inside of a, a snail. And mm-hmm. it's usually, of course, the ones I've seen, of course, over the past 15 years are all the Caribbean species. And this one little tadpole pops up, it has a slight change in the first temperature, of course, and it gets in the cleanup crew. And people have posted only twice ever seen online. I narrowed it down. It's a small path, uh, for a pathogen, well, pathogen parasite that has a 
two and a half to three day window of swimming stage. Mm-hmm. And if we can't find a fish, they all die out. But it was posted online. A couple people, no one knew what it was. And it looks like a little, um, think of a flatworm with a little tail. And they're quite literally the size of a, a pinhead. I mean, they were all over the glass. And I've seen a couple of people just completely freak out about it. And it's only because I've been in the hobby for so long. I just randomly see these strange occurrences. But it took me a little while to narrow it down. Because the tanks were completely sterile. Top to bottom, there wasn't even a hint of algae on the glass. Not even a dusting of diatoms. And it would just pop right up just because it just happened to break open the snail. And that was the only thing in the tank. Crazy. Kind of goes, so it, it kind of goes back to the, to hearing people that have never done quarantine say that they want to quarantine to such a degree that they don't have any issues. It's like, you'll be surprised at how good issues are. Oh, yeah. And how inexperienced oh, yeah. you are at quarantine. Because, <laughs> by the way, there are places that probably have biosecurity that sure. does work. Oh, yeah. But they're not hobbyists. They're not coral farms. They're not pet stores. Yeah. They're like, probably like shed aquarium like oh, that yeah. type of stuff like, they'll, they'll, i've seen places like that they'll quarantine for over well over a year no, they'll have clean before. rooms oh like, yeah like you need to like change your clothes into like sterile clothes oh yeah yeah i've seen sticky pads as far as i've gone in just like you would go into a medical facility yeah where you you walk in you have to put the booties all over your shoes yeah and before you put the booties on you have to walk through almost like a a giant stick pad of ours and it's whatever is the bottom of your shoe it just just rips it right off mm-hmm. and then you put the booty on just so you can step into the facility just to make sure it's that clean so yeah like like oh, serious yeah. clean rooms with serious biosecurity and guess what <laughs> leaks still happen in those <laughs> yeah. like god <laughs> like yeah the the, the idea of like uh, yeah I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop hair algae by quarantining like i will put money on it that you will not and we're not saying quarantine is bad. Quarantine is quarantine definitely a good thing. Quarantine is a thing. great tool. Yes. It's a great tool. Manage your expectations. And, and, and also, and it's not that they're not being like realistic about their, um, their evaluation of their skill at this. It's just that if you've never done it before, mm-hmm. it ain't going to work the first time. Mm-hmm. Just saying. It ain't going to work <laughs> the second time either or the third time. And at some point, it's like, do I... Am I just going to kill all these corals? Because, like, the, the, the whole process of quarantining and, and the multiple rounds of dipping, it's, like, it is all stress. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot of times, like, you're, you're just killing the patient at some point. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the thing that you're really trying to eliminate is way better at surviving this than your coral is. Yeah, yeah. That's the scary part. Especially the eggs. Eggs are just... Yeah, they survive hard. Eggs are so good. They're so good at what they do. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're they're literally designed to prevent the outside world from attacking the, of course, the, you know, the little it's one like, inside. It's like how is it that like a chicken egg stays good in your fridge for like ninety, di- like how long? Oh yeah, like, for months. Days of, like, yeah, exactly. Freaking months, <laughs> unperturbed. Oh yeah, you could you could paint it, you could do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> the, the inside is still gonna be just fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Harkins messaged me earlier and said he wants all of us to get together. It'd be so much fun. Yeah, it would be. We should. Uh, JBM. Both eat Aptasia. One and one are the best, but Bogesi do also. Okay. Cool. Mm. Uh, my shrimps have gone rogue, started munching on acros. They're fixing to get evicted. <laughs> I had a victim too. <laughs> Time to go. See, so uh, I like interceptor treating my tanks. We, um, I was that's, about to say that we, had, we we got a sweetheart deal. We didn't get a sweetheart deal. We got a very, very, very expensive deal with a vet to do it all very, very, very on the books, above board, to do this properly. Approved. So <laughs> I am like... I, I am paying such a premium on Interceptor, <laughs> but we got, like, a lot of Interceptor here. And I would use the hell out of it more, except that I always feel horrible if we are unable to catch all the shrimp. Oh, and yeah. Move them. Cause you, <laughs> oh, I hate killing, like, cleaner shrimp. 
Because, like, we just oh. couldn't catch a cleaner shrimp in a show tank or something. Yeah. Freaking hate it. Cleaner shrimp, any of the anemone shrimp, I mean, anything uh, with that. Well, there. We don't just... have any of those, luckily. Um, e- even, even like, the, um, the emerald crabs oh, that, yeah. like, hide like crazy and never want to, like, you know. Yeah. Oh, Interceptor kills the hell out of those. But it's so good for your tank. <laughs> yeah. it, ma- it makes me want to have, like, no shrimp, no crabs of any kind tanks. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't had a shrimp or a crab in my tank, except for hermit crabs. I oh, keep, dead. I keep uh, scar- the only ones I ever keep are the scarlet red hermit crabs. It's okay. the only hermit crab that I've that I'll keep, uh, that I've kept since nineteen ninety seven. It's all it was the same crab. No, the same crab. Well, only species of crab. Oh, okay. <laughs> I should say. No, no, because I've, I've had one that lived a really long time. Yeah, That's I, mean, what I was wondering. No, oh, well, I have scarlets that are are I haven't replenished my cleaning crew in probably about. Eight nine years. Okay, so yeah. So I have a few of them that are really old. Before I even went to college, yeah. Before I went back to get my engineering degree, they were still the same yeah. ones there in the tank. I haven't gotten any wow. new ones yet. I have a sea cucumber that was, uh, well, Stephanie says she wanted it now, so she's now it's in her tank that is somewhere around just under a decade old, a Florida yellow sea cucumber, and he's he's kept her sand clean, like crystal clean, <laughs> for eight, it's, the second I moved in, it it's taken over. And wow. it's loved the sand ever since. So, so you were saying about interceptor and your crabs? Yes, of course. Okay. I don't. Uh, yeah, I was starting getting clean oh. crew. Uh, you don't use interceptor because of your crabs. I haven't used interceptor. Well, that's the only thing I haven't in my tank. So, if I did use interceptor, of course, I've used it before, but um, I haven't had any shrimp or crabs to clean or catch in mm. a very, very long time. I see. So, I only have a few of the hermits, and my tank is a more of a very minimalist. So, finding them is a lot easier than than expected. Gotcha. Yeah, I uh, it it does really make me want to to go to a no shrimp no crab tank, because yeah. it's th- that that treatment is so helpful. It just like so people uh, I know people love amphipods. Mm-hmm. I would argue that they're actually bad for your system. <laughs> like I've seen amphipods like go after and eat, like um, I've seen them go after and eat like a sea cucumber. Really? Yeah. God. That's like, oh, that looks awful. Yeah, that's not good at all. <laughs> yeah, uh, they they eat burgia eggs. Yeah, they eat burgia. We uh, we we had a there was a culture of burgias we had to take. We had to literally suck every single one of the amphids, the, the larger ones, because they were just munching on them. Yeah, until because they were never they would, there would be eggs, but there would be nothing to grow. <laughs> Interceptor. I did done. And, and you know, then all of a sudden, all your burgias go crazy. <laughs> that's all that's left. That's the key. Interceptor that tank. <laughs> I've never thought of that. That's a good idea. It's awesome. <laughs> it is awesome. And, you know, and this isn't like, oh, you you you, you trade seek. No, 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 no. Kill the aptasia, get the burgias, kill amphipods to get the burgia. <laughs> That's not Come a bad on, idea. guys. Come on, guys. I never thought of that. That was good. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know the name of the species of flatworms. It's a very good point. Smash the like button, y'all. <laughs> uh, sea cucumbers, can't they nuke your livestock if they die? No. I'm tired of hearing of that. Apparently not. Okay, okay. Let me let me explain. As far as, a lot of times before with sea cucumbers, think they are just very, very, they can, nuke, they can, they cannot nuke your tank. A lot of times people are saying they're nuked because some kind of this, a poison in their skin, there's a toxin, there's a venom or something that, that they release out of them. No, it's a big squishy animal that as far as it rots very, very fast. So you will have a giant spike in nutrients and you're going to have a dead creature dying, melting in your tank. And we're not talking about sea and, apples. We're talking about just a regular old in yeah, the substrate. As far as, because I, I, a lot of times I've seen them in the parish, as far as, and if you, they'll start deteriorating within less than an hour. You'll start smelling it. You, you can take the body out and you start smelling it. And a lot of times when they die, it's because they just, you just die of starvation. You mm-hmm. put them in a brand new tank with a clean sand bed and they're there to clean the sand bed and there's nothing to eat inside the sand bed. So that's the majority of the time when they climb up the glass and they go into a bower head because they're just mm. looking for food. Mm. As far as people put them in brand new tanks, but if you put them in an established sand bed that's been there for a while, as far as I've never once had one climb up the glass. What do they typically eat? Like like a, a black one from like the Caribbean? A lot of the Caribbean species, a lot of times they'll just eat a lot of detritus. They'll eat uh, as far as any kind of biofilm off the actual sand itself. Um, you'll see, if you look closely at almost any sand bed in general, you see the little worms that will go against the glass, climb up. They'll consume some of those. Anything they can get in their mouth, as far as from the sand bed, they'll just kind of take right up. Okay, 
I've never seen him actually eat food, like fish food or anything that off the ground. So but just off the wall question. So in my non-photo tank, mm -hmm. it produces a copious amount of detritus and what looks like just bacterial mulm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. But it's a bare bottom tank. But it's all practically making its own bottom. It's making its own silt and sand bottom. Kind Even, of and this is crazy, guys. I siphoned that tank. I siphoned <laughs> the bottom of that tank not long ago. And if you look down there now, yeah. it looks like there's like a pile of detritus. I siphoned <laughs> that pile and the sump already. It's already. It's already there. So I'm like, I wonder if like the sea cucumber would like this. It's possible. Or would it just be like, bleh? <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't know. <laughs> That's, I mean, I mean that who, is... who keeps a cucumber in a, in a bare bottom tank? Yeah. Know? I have never done that. <laughs> I don't want to make any speculation. Oh. Uh, oh, that Ghani is nice. Relevation's Ghani. It's cool. That's a gorgeous Ghani. The, like, the highlighted tips on it. We're trying to like expand our Ghani collection for sure. Yeah, your Ghani collection is definitely expanding, and it's nice. I so people always ask me like, "What's your favorite coral?" And it changes over the years. Yeah, we've been doing this like course. thirty years or something. But lately, um, I really do like Ghani's, and um, so we, we we happen to have like a lot of space right now, and so any time that we can like find nice new Ghani's, we just kind of sit there and just kind of try to pamper them. Oh yeah. But they're they're not the, they're not the most difficult, but they're not the easiest either. Yeah, there is actually a new Ghani that it's because we remember we were talking prior for us about corals that some are just absolutely spectacular color. There is one that I just saw at, at, at locally in Texas that it's not crazy color. Mm -hmm. It's just a just a classic more of a bluish green Ghani. The reason why I'm considering buying it is because I've never seen a Ghani that is as it's like as thick as a big carrot. The tentacles are between 12 to 20 inches long. It is next to Ghani is like by itself. It looks exactly the same, but I've never seen a polyp of this size. Huh. It's one of those things that I'd probably show Julian and saying, have you ever seen anything like this? Like just a massive, massive tentacle of ours on it. And the entire Ghani, every single one is exactly the same. It's just oddball big. But that is, oh yeah, I love finding those ones. I need to get more excited about finding new corals. I I love finding new corals. It's so much fun. We went to a we went to like a big wholesaler yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and I and, and I bought a box of coral, right? <laughs> and and so you know like he, him coming from Top Shelf is like, you know, the the normal volume that like Top Shelf would buy. And he's like, "This is all you got?" I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> and this is like all I'll get for like 2 months. That this was, is it. That was like a, a Thursday, a random Thursday afternoon that we would get <laughs> just, you know, something small. Yeah, and this is literally like, yeah, that's probably all the corals we're going to be buying for at least a month. We just don't get a lot of corals here. You brought your own cooler, and I was like, oh, yeah, they look cool right there. I was like, oh, okay, that's just going to be, oh, it's probably for the, you know, the sale always coming up. No, this is for the next couple months. I'm like, we just we're, we're we're a bad wholesale customer. So all all these places that want like a you know to to sell Tidal Gardens corals, sell corals to Tidal Gardens as a wholesaler, it's like guys, literally the worst customer. You will not hear from me. <laughs> but yeah, but but okay, so we were uh, also having a little bit of a laugh because like right now the the hottest um, like story. In like in, in coral land, is like they opening up a Fiji and like Fiji corals coming back, and the the place where we went, eye catching coral, they had what seventy boxes of Fiji coral. How many Fiji corals did I buy? Mm. <laughs> zero to none. <laughs> zero, but zero of them. It's because you and I were both around when Fiji was open and the Fiji was coming in. Of course, I love the fact there's new species and stuff like that. And of course, the yellow Fiji leather, mm -hmm. which you still have had since the last 10 years. You never, it never disappeared from your collection. Yeah, we were still aquaculturing and it. And it's, it's, you know, I'm happy to hear that it's open. But when it was open, it was, it's still the same stuff it that was, I remember. It, was, it wasn't like Australia opening. Yeah. Like, a, so... 
yeah, when Australia first opened, it was like, oh my, what the hell is this? Yes. Fiji was never that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I'm looking for new Fiji stuff. That stuff that they never sent over before. Because they didn't have the, the, any taste or eye for it. Yes, exactly. Because like Indo. Yes, that exactly. Indo exactly. now is dope, right? Oh, they know, what they're look, they, they have a better idea what they're looking for. Indo in the 90s, not dope. Yeah, they were just grabbing things. Okay, this is uh, brown. Uh, it's brown. Sure. Green. Sure. Yeah. This brown. looks a little sure. pink at sunset. All right, good. I'll you throw that one in the box. But now they have blue flashlights and they're going underwater. They're looking for like holy you know, grail torches, yeah. like, like spliced holy grail torches <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Not now, like like Indo's fire. Yeah. Exactly. And I have feeling that Fiji's never been fire, and they haven't yeah. shown the aptitude to like. They haven't really had, search it out. Yeah, they haven't like had the desire to like, go and find the new as far as Holy Real 2.0 that's out there that no one's because it could possibly be there. But they've they're like the classic, they're like the '90s corals, like the classic corals that are coming back. That it's a it can be a big colony, big color. And that's it. For as, there was a couple of things that we saw there. A lot of Pasilipora. That <laughs> a lot I was of like <laughs> Jim. <laughs> uh, uh, he's, he's one of the owners of iCatch and he wasn't even there I don't even know why I just said his name but it was like they charged you for this Jim like Jim you paid taxes and paperwork and shipping for this yes like, Jim <laughs> you could literally have bought all of this for five dollars from me, <laughs> in at scale, and, and and I and you know this, and you didn't buy it because you didn't want this. Yes. Why are you buying Fiji Pasilipora? <laughs> so much Pasilipora. Oh my god. I didn't buy any. There was like. Needless to say. I mean, just one tray was like just twenty colonies of Pasilipora. I'm like, that I, was four hundred dollars to ship. I'm like, we we already have that. Like. It spawns itself in tanks, and they would just pop up on your power head randomly, like, oh, and you're just trying to scrape it off because, They well, made you buy yeah. it, by the way. That's a dope. That's oh, serious. that's nice. Yeah. We'll have to take a look Rainbow at it. Rainbow serious? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, it's got the split tentacles, too, on yep. the, as far as that one. That's a gorgeous piece. Yeah, that's nice. That's super nice. That's the sort of stuff that I, that I get excited about collecting. I don't even know. Where, where are those from, Diaceruses? These types. Uh, Part Cycloceruses. I think they're... Indo? It could be Indo. I think it's Indo. I'm pretty sure it's Indo, those ones. And I'm telling you, Indo's fire. Yeah. The coral <laughs> triangle right there. Yeah. Guys, this show is almost over. So um, I, I forget exactly which number we go to, but it can't be more than like the next five or ten. So real quick, I wanted to say thank you to both Stephanie and David for coming and hanging out. They're going to be guy. here for yet another day. It was almost like a podcast we almost had set down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so these guys are still on their on their on their re- relaxation tour. This is the most work that I'm going to make them do this weekend <laughs> is to come and hang out on a live stream and talk corals and stuff. And this that. is fun for me, so I'm happy to talk corals all day long. There's no problem. <laughs> yeah, you got a massage earlier in the massage chair. Mm, yeah, that thing. That nice. thing is nice. It's a pretty good gig here to come and hang out. It's a cushy gig. <laughs> <laughs> Dave on Tidal Gardens show. What's up, brother? Hope all is well. Pollock Pusher. Do you know Pollock Pusher? Oh, yeah. He's a friend from Florida. He was, uh, for us, another, he was a collector down there for us, and he worked at uh, his stores. But um, I bump into him, Aquashella, and he's just really fun to talk to because he, he's really always excited about Coral. So what's up, buddy? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Pollock Pusher's like, Pasapora, no bueno. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how it be. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Yeah, the Fiji stuff. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of stuff. You know, hopefully people will find some exciting stuff, and maybe we just yeah. need to see it. I mean, I I think as it slowly comes in, and maybe some wild colonies, it might be a little bit know. different. But I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Of course, I. It's such a large area out there. There's got to be more than the classics that were there. Is Fiji a big area? Well, most of the places aren't the big, big. I mean, I mean, 
if they're only collecting from one side of like the island and the other side is unexplored because it's different water conditions, more flow, more forest, and more nutrients, there could be a whole different range of species on that side if they're only collecting and growing from like one little portion. Because mm -hmm. think when you go to an island, you go scuba diving, for instance, you have the calm side where you have everybody's on the beach and relaxing. You have the ocean side. So it could definitely vary the types of corals. So it's possible. I'll have to see it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm optimistic. <laughs> One thing that they, they, they did have was like a lot of trachees and stuff that was kind of neat. And yeah. trachees lately had been like so, um, so delicate from a lot of geographies. So I didn't buy any. I didn't buy any Fiji trachees, but that's something that I might consider. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie almost tripped almost, on a cord. I almost, <laughs> almost had an accident. Yeah, you would have seen our lighting change dramatically for a sec. <laughs> yeah. Just lighting comes straight down. On <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, that pretty much does it for our uh, for our live stream. Thanks again for joining, and uh, we will see you all next time. Happy reefing. <laughs> Bye, guys.